Hey, everybody. It is your normal host for Heavy Art Talk. You got Lee here, and I'm honored to have uh, a couple of things as a first. So it's my first international guest and also my first guest where we're just going to have a drink while we talk, too. So cheers to that. But I got Dan Goldsworthy here who, man, he's just had his art all over the scene in the last couple of years. It's been amazing to see. Um, it's almost like he has so much flexibility in his style that you sometimes don't even realize that he made all these different albums. But Zentrix, the new Corpse Grinder album, the new Haken album, which has extremely intricate, uh, awesome painting style. Uh, who else, man? I mean, there's so many. Um, Glory uh, Hammer, Ailstorm. You've done a ton with Ailstorm. In Human Condition, he's done the two album covers and then the upcoming EP. But yeah, Dan, man, welcome to the show. It is so much fun to be talking with you tonight, and I appreciate thanks. you yeah. staying up late. Oh, pleasure. L I love talking about this sort of stuff. So thank you very much for asking me. It's really nice to meet you, and hopefully we'll have a good fun chat about all this sort of stuff that presumably you love as much as I do, so we could oh, yeah. yap about it for ages, you know? Yeah, totally, man. So... I'm in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, so right on the East Coast, down in like the South. Where are you located then? I am in Aberdeen, Scotland, um, in the north of the UK. I was English originally, but I moved up here when I was about 10. So I've got a kind of mixed accent that is yeah. not, not yet. No, but you, you know, you go down to England and everyone thinks you sound Scottish. You live up here and everyone thinks you sound English you can't win wherever you go but uh hopefully for the uh, an international audience no one will just care it's just a strange foreigner <laughs> oh that's funny man I was thinking it was a slight Scottish accent but it's not real prominent because I, I went to Scotland uh you know I'm not like some worldly traveler or anything I just I went to Dublin then Edinburgh and London all in one trip and uh, I got a little taste of it. And, man, it's so cool being able to go to these different areas. Um, and they all have, like, their own unique flavor and culture. But it doesn't take that long to get there. You no, know? at all. Because, obviously, you're used to getting, going 500 miles just to get to the next big city over in the States. Everything's so far away. I, I understand the geography. Because there's not actually that many more people, relatively speaking, in, Amer in, in North America compared to over here. It's just, you know, maybe five times the population. But a hundred times the size of the area. So yeah, yeah. We're, we're super compact here, really. And have you been to the United States at all? Yeah, um, Christmas 93, when I was 10. Because my, <laughs> uh, <laughs> a long time ago, uh, my mom's sister, so my auntie and her family, they're all American and they live in, well, it used to be Van Nuys, California. But okay. I think they, they've moved closer to the lakes i think in california but you know for years i've been meaning to go back there and we'd love to go back but it's always easier because most of our family is over here whenever we meet up mm -hmm. at weddings and funerals you know so we've been to the americans getting married but rather than getting married in la they brought their family over here so just because it's cheaper that way rather than flying a hundred folk or, or yeah all the family out that way but but i've got young kids uh, who are 18 months and five years old and when they're oh, a bit older aiming to go to disneyland or disney world especially now that i've got lots of good friends because uh, the likes of inhuman condition who i'm sure we'll talk florida, about in yeah. some course yeah they're florida guys and they're really close to me now they're, they're really good friends it's not it's not just a band they're they sort of feel like family that you can phone up and talk to so i'd love to visit those guys at some stage and tie it in with a, a disney world trip and pretend that i'm 10 again <laughs> Yeah, maybe you'll run into Corpse Grinder there too. He's a pretty reg he's a, a regular attendee at Disney World. I've heard. That's, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> uh, I'll stay away from the claw machines though, because I know it's wrecked yeah. with all that. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah, man. Um, so Disney World would definitely be a lot easier than Disneyland, just given that uh, you know time zone wise. But that's really cool. So yeah, I've only been to UK once, so. It's it's definitely always interesting, like some of the cultural similarities and differences, which will probably come up a little bit. Even it's just like the words that we use yes. and you guys use. I just always find that stuff really interesting. I think it's just very quickly on that note. I think it's got so much closer together in the post-internet age, where everyone, yeah. like everyone from where you live to London to the north of Scotland, everyone uses the same kind of dialects and words. But like, oh, that's sick, man, and that's awesome. Whereas twenty years ago 
every little region had their own weird British word for good, you know, or whatever. Whereas yeah. now everybody just almost because of the internet, everyone's on the same. They're, they're on Reddit and Twitter and Facebook and my, not MySpace anymore. But you know, all of that. Yeah. Just sort of the language has got a lot more homogenized. Which makes it easier for an Englishman <laughs> living in Scotland uh, these days, anyway. Totally. We're talking about, um, you know, a little bit of our youth and then also like the UK. I was just curious because, um, so I'm 31 and I think you're just a little bit older than me, but, you know, pretty close in terms of that. Um, what was it like, like in terms of the like heavy music scene when you were a teenager? And were you, so you were in, well, no, you were in Scotland at that time, right? Or I was, in Britain? Yeah, I was in Scotland. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I was born in 83, um, so I'm 40, and I moved here in 93. But yeah. By the time, like I lived in a, I grew up in a small town in Scotland. Um, and even though I've been into heavy music for, since I was a child, uh, a young child, not many other people were around here. So it was only when I went to university in 2000, uh at age 17 was when i started becoming more aware of an actual music scene so my involvement with playing in bands and going to gigs pretty much starts at i guess the height of the new metal era in 2000 <laughs> okay. um, and and from that I, I you know i started playing in bands but very quickly after that i saw the whole emo and screamo shift into metalcore in the mid 2000s which yep. i'm i'm probably guessing was very similar to what was going on in the states but really, yeah. it'll, be, it'll be a year behind because everything that we have ever done over here you know beyond the 70s and stuff but you know in, in recent years since america took over as the big music producer the uk has always been about a year behind for trends and scenes to catch up but it was amazing like i mean i, I met my wife in the music scene i played in bands for years um and we used to get loads of great bands from the uk and from the states and everywhere come up and play and i su i supported half of them like when they came to my town eventually but what we have noticed in recent years it died down a little bit given there isn't there isn't a scene to latch on to like there was in say the mid 2000s when metal like, you know in the emo scene of the early 2000s or new metal before or metalcore from sort of 2002 to 2008 yeah. there'd be loads of scene kids going to shows Mm -hmm. gigs were packed and the grassroots venues were always rammed whereas there isn't any of that anymore the venues have all shut down because there's people you know people get their music for free on spotify um they there's no real trend in metal i wouldn't say these days i don't know if you'd agree with that at all there's there's it's like smaller trends and local too, like um, in Atlanta, it's got a pretty thriving metal scene, but Atlanta is a pretty big metro area and it's continuously growing. And it's also very multicultural as well, which brings in new ideas and stuff. But um, I went to a show recently. I saw Drain, like the hardcore band. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like kind of crossover thrash, really excellent band live. But that show was sold out and absolutely insane. And like you, you felt the energy of something – big is coming i think there's like actually a bit of a uh, a new wave of like hardcore bands that are popping up that are getting a lot of steam you know knock loose drain jesus peace that kind of stuff and then the other scene that's really big right now too still somewhat rooted in hardcore is the you know the new school of death metal bands on death yes. frozen soul sanguisugabog they have a little bit of that hardcore influence i think a lot of it is you know young people want to be around other young musicians who are trying to be ambitious and make a name for themselves. So that's what they're feeding off. And with hardcore in particular, you get an excellent stage show and not just musicianship. And I think that's what the next generation wants. They want that spectacle plus hopefully the musicianship too, which I think all those bands have great musicianship as well in their own right. It's funny you mention that trio of bands, actually, because I was saying this to somebody else recently, that it feels like all of a sudden, after 20, 30 years, bands, and especially American bands, have discovered Bolt Thrower. And <laughs> yeah. It's like, and so you get the Frozen, not so much on death, because, you know, they're a bit more maybe in the 
Cannibal, cannibal Corpse. corpse. Yeah. yeah. And, and a friend of mine described them recently as fun Cannibal Corpse. And I was like, yes, that's exactly yeah. what it is. But like with Frozen Soul and Sanguisugabog, it's like it's taken that caveman bolt thrower style metal that uh, death metal was is brilliant. And it's like, how how has it taken people so long to latch onto this? In much the same way that I guess in the metalcore scene, they took the carcass and at the gates and went like, oh, let's just. So yeah. it, it was Mellow Death and, and Metalcore. You know, it took both those bands after the fact and went, let's build an entire scene. And I think we're seeing that with Bolt Thrower um, influence right now, which um, I, I, I'd honestly never noticed any bands kind of take that Bolt Thrower sound up until the last couple of years and it's just yeah. crept in. And, um, and I guess maybe that's why you're seeing a resurgence because it's something a little bit new. And we've got that over here with bands like, uh, they're a Scottish band, Coffin Mulch yeah. as well, who had taken that slow kind of, not detuning super, super heavy, but yeah, yeah just playing those, that kind of mid-tempo, simple death metal that's really the catchy. And, it, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good fun stuff. Yeah, I think like prior to kind of the bolt thrower type worship related bands, and like I'm not saying that as a condescending thing. I love all those bands, um, but like I think Incantation was the band previous to that that everyone was kind of like taking their sound from. That was a little more popular, and then um, there's some bands kind of taking some like Demolic type sounds. It's interesting. Now that's that's an interesting topic too. So there is the internet age, obviously. But I do find myself still listening, if I really am honest with myself, mostly to American bands, even though it doesn't really, you can't tell the sound, like nobody sounds necessarily like British or Scottish when they're doing death metal vocals, but they're still somewhat of a regional influence. I think it's part of his touring convenience, but yeah. I'm in Georgia, right? So I do listen mostly to Florida and then the New York style death metal bands and, uh, I like Carcass. I like Bolt Thrower uh, like a lot, but for some reason I don't grab for them as frequently as like Morbid Angel, Death, Cannibal Corpse, Suffocation. What is it like for you then being a you know in the UK? Um, I honestly, I think these days we'll get more of your stuff in the press or on our minds more than the other way round. Um, yeah. But I honestly don't even really think about where a band comes from these days um especially not within the death metal realm where like you say you can't tell necessarily vocally but i mean i've been reaching a lot recently for hm2 style metal bands like dismember yeah. and, and in tune the swedish stuff and you're exactly right and it's like that sound if you're listening to the early records is so rooted in that sunlight studios 1990 to 93 or something um and within those records, you can the olden ones, you can totally tell that it's Swedish stuff. But so many bands, again, have take over the years have taken that HM2 sound to the point that if I hear it, I know where it's come from. But I don't necessarily think of where the band that I'm listening to at that time is. If you see what I mean, yeah. Um, and I've heard a bunch of that again come out recently, and at no point have I really considered where it is because I guess I check out bands on recommendations, and because we don't get anybody really playing here like i went to I, I hardly go to gigs anymore but i had to go and see carcass the other day mm -hmm. and i mentioned coffin mulch but they were actually one of the support bands and i i'm familiar with them being scottish because i knew about them before but if you just do, if i got thrown into that show i'd have no idea where they were from really because you you couldn't tell so yeah lo long story short for me it doesn't bother i don't grab for anything regional in the slightest um mm -hmm. and probably grab for the american bands more than anything because i grew up on the deaths and uh, cannibal corpse and obituaries of this world i love the florid the floridian death metal stuff so i go for that all the time myself nice now how does that relate to like how you started getting into heavy metal and did that have a parallel with you know your art then just a sneak peek later uh, I am going to pull up some of your age 13 and 14 drawings <laughs> because I thought, it, I thought they were really good for that age. And it just, it's cool seeing the progression. Right. But like, what was that overlap like? And um, what was it like kind of growing up and finding metal and, and drawing? I mean, I honestly wouldn't consider myself an artist. I think I'm exclusively a heavy metal, a guy who draws heavy metal covers. And I always have been because that's all I've ever wanted to do um, since I was art wise, since I was a kid. So my my 
introduction to metal and art actually happened at the same time. My dad always listened to heavy stuff, like oh, he relative, Deep Purple, Led Zeppelin, maybe yeah. up to Black Sabbath, that kind of thing. So rock music was always in my um, household and DNA. But when I was eight years old, a friend of mine at school, uh, his older brother was a good artist and he'd drawn a piece of mind, a uh, piece of mind, sorry, by Iron, Iron Maiden. And I just thought it was the most unbelievably cool thing I'd ever seen. I'd never heard Iron Maiden. Well, I probably had heard Iron Maiden because at that time, Be Quick or Be Dead would have been on the radios here or there. But you don't put two and two together. I just thought it was the most amazing piece of art ever. And I got a Iron Maiden T-shirt when I was eight without hearing the band ever. Yeah. And then when I went to then when I went to America in '93 over Christmas, um, you know, I only had I had a Guns N' Roses tape that I'd bought when I was younger and some Michael Jackson stuff. And my dad took me to Tower Records, and I was like, I'm going to buy some Iron Maiden stuff because I don't know what it sounds like, but if it looks that cool, it's got to sound amazing. So I bought Killers on cassette. Uh, and absolutely loved it. And from there, it completely, I just stare at the cover and listen to the music. And because it was pretty much my only cassette at that point, just absolutely obliterate it. And then as soon as I get any pocket money or any Christmas money, you're into buying just Iron Maiden cassettes or, or similar -ish stuff. And around that time, my older cousin who lived in London was two years older. There was way much more, there's far more music for him at that the time and he was cool and he played in the band himself he just sent me loads of stuff like here's cannibal corpse of bleeding here's machine <laughs> here's yeah like here's machine head uh burn my eyes here's pantera far beyond driven all these albums from 1994 which was when it was and i was like 11 years old and i'd just been basically been given all these cassette like there was a bunch of slayer stuff in there as well just thrown in the deep end of here is all this awesome music and I guess from then on, like he started giving me cassettes and he'd write me letters saying, oh, you have to check out all of these bands. And he gave me a bunch of samplers. Like there was a Kerrang was cool back then, um, you know, and a lot heavier. He gave me a Kerrang compilation that had like a bitchery and stuff on it and, uh, and a terrorizer compilation that had death and dismember on it. So I was like, right, next time I go into a CD shop uh, or a cassette shop at that time, um, before going on holiday, I'm going to go and buy some CDs so that, or tapes, sorry. And uh, I just go and buy whatever songs that I'd heard on these mixtapes. And naturally, you gravitate to the ones that have got the coolest cover. And oh, yeah, you got that secret part. Yeah, exactly. So it, that's pretty much how things started. Was It was directly because of um, the art looks cool, get into the music, then it's a case of, well, which album am I going to buy? The one with the coolest art. And then just go from there. And then through all through school, uh, in, in art class, like all my final exams were like, here's Eddie, here's Vic Rattlehead. I'll just pretend I came up with it. <laughs> and, and, uh, and the teachers didn't know any better. And that, <laughs> that, that's all I did, you know. So that, that's the early years. But they, they go completely hand in hand for me. And, and it's really like... Eddie was my first true love. And then when I discovered the Megadeth albums like Rust in Peace and Peace Cells a couple of years later, it's like, that's what I want to draw just because it looks amazing. That's so cool, man. And uh, the fact that you, you're like a metal first and artist second is so interesting because, and, and trust me, I'm going to butter you up a little bit because I love your work. All right. So just be prepared for a little flattery. But Thank like you. your work is like next level, man. And you're so humble about it. Like, I mean, so this piece behind us, right? It's got a little bit of a Roger Dean aspect to it, but a morbid. Oh, yeah. You can see this like sideways skull. It reminds me of that classical painting where there's the um, the skull, but you can only really see it if you tilt your head. I don't know if that's yes. intentional. It was that it intentional? Was. It was. Um, yeah. by, oh, I've forgotten his name. Someone, Holb, Heinz Holbein. Is he the um, guy who did that, uh, the, the wedding? Where it's like super detailed and you see the reflection of the people and it's like uh, Renaissance period. We'll look it up you later. Right. But. I think it's it called the ambassadors, the bit that you're referring to. Is that the piece maybe? But yeah, it's a I portrait and you just snuck it in. It was like an early Easter egg, right? Yeah, exactly that. And you've got but you've got to look at it from a ridiculously extreme angle to see yeah. it. But yes, that we'll get well, I suppose we can chat about that now. Charlie um Griffiths from who asked me to do this art, he basically was like well, between us, the brief was like, what if Dan Seagrave did a 
Yes album cover. <laughs> Bingo. Uh, so that, and I was like, I love Roger Dean. I love yeah. Dan Seagrave. I love all your music and everything we're talking about. And let so let's do it. And I, I, I don't know if you've noticed this yourself, but there's a skull in the upside down skull in the landscape inverted. So everyone notices the skull island that you look at from a perspective. But if you right. rotate it 90 degrees, it's mirrored on the bottom. Oh. It's, it's crazy. I've got, oh, let me give it a second. I've got the vinyl here for you, um, I think. Um, just... Yeah, I didn't put this one in the slide deck, but yeah, please show me. Oh, it's, sorry. If I, I, I should have it here, but uh, come on. Oh, yeah, I've got it. Yeah, I'm going to make this, it bigger. This is, this is brilliant viewing. Okay, so so everyone sees that that from an angle. It kind of right. you know, can't, can't really do it there. But if you turn it upside down, uh, where are we? Sorry, this is, this is dreadful here. No, you can it's kind difficult. of see over here. Uh, where are we? You get... Oh, should I see it now? When you that, see it, you don't unsee it, but it takes you, a second. That's, yes, I see yeah. it now. Sorry about my camera skills there. That's absolutely abysmal. But then you, it, you, it's really difficult to get the angle just right. Is that good? Is that? That's, no, that's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't see it now, you're blind. Sorry, guys. Yeah. Not blind. And so that that one that bit was my idea, but it was directly taken from the ambassador's piece that Charlie recommended. Because I loved I love doing all that sort of silly stuff. It's it's super fun. Yeah. And, yeah, it, it, and, it get, and I think people connect with art a little bit better when you go, oh, no way, there's a thing there that <laughs> I didn't spot before. And then yeah. they, go hunting, they go hunting for more, and you might not find anything, but it, it, that's what you want. Because one of my favorite album covers was Somewhere in Time, because oh, you'd yeah. open it up and go, there's, a th there's Ace's High Bar, there's a football score here, there's a poster of an Iron Maiden show, and there's all these little bits and bobs that I guess keep you engaged with it a bit more than oh cover done yeah but, yeah sorry I've, I've rambled on on a tangent there i don't know if yeah, i've answered this your is the whole thing man this is the show you're you're doing perfect but i do think it's interesting that somebody at your skill level still doesn't like considering himself an artist and I, I think i understand why you don't want the pretentious association with it and i resonate with that but your skill level and your technique is top notch i mean and while you might not want to you know boast about that like your stuff obviously speaks for itself and not only that uh i wanted to talk about this too but you have so many repeat customers so you must be doing something right from the relationship building and business perspective so if you feel comfortable i, I kind of want to hear a little bit about like maybe how you go about it or why you think maybe you have so many repeat customers beyond just the quality of your work yeah, sure. Well, I mean, first things first, it, it might sound a bit of a cliche or cheesy, but I'm primarily a fan, like absolutely yeah. a fan first, artist second. Um, and the bands that I work with, almost all of them, especially the repeat customers, I don't just really like them. I love their music. And I, I don't just love their music because I'm working with them. I, I love their music, so I get absorbed into it. And then I want to put in the most amount of effort I physically can. I, mean, I put in the most effort I can for every person who's asking me to do work. But just when you listen to like, so when I listen to like the last glory, we did the last glory hammer album, they sent me it and I loved it. And I, I played it like 70 or 80 times. That's not an exaggeration. I can show you my iTunes thing. It's up at over <laughs> beyond 80. Um, and you don't do that. If you don't love what you're working for, you might give it a cursory once or twice. Listen, um, but I just kind of get engrossed and I worked really hard for everyone that's a repeat customer. I get on really well with them. Um, and there's actually almost a downside of being a friend of bands as well as working for them. And that's the business side because you don't want to put up your rates because, <laughs> because you feel like, oh, these are my friends now. I, what can yeah. I do? But at the same time, you, you do have to grow. So there's always a compromise. And I always kind of delay putting up rates as long as I, as long as I can. But, I honestly think it's just because I get on with every, I get on really well with all of these guys. Um, I probably, I work as hard as I can. And I guess they know the level that they're going to get. Um, yeah. And they know the effort that's going to be put in. So there's no real reason for them to change. And I find that humbling because I know that a lot of the bands that I'm working with now, 
they could choose anybody that they wanted. And a lot of the bands I've worked for have had my absolute heroes do artwork before them. And I, I wouldn't necessarily ever compare my stuff to my heroes in anything other than style rather than quality. Right. But if other people feel comfortable getting me on board to do something kind of like for example in human conditions like everyone will see my work and obviously go repco in a lot of places because he's my hero with the megadeth and death stuff but doing the in human condition stuff that was meant to be originally meant to be a massacre record and massacre used ed for their early covers so they actually got me on board to kind of do something similar to those early massacre covers and it went from there and for me that's that is massively humbling that people would kind of go well you know but they probably could have got ed rep because you know terry from death and that is in the band there's enough if, if ed wanted to do it and they wanted him to do it they, they could have done that but for whatever reason i've been asked and then you do a decent job and they ask you back for more and and then the inhuman condition guys they're friends and they've said to me loads of times oh, we don't want anyone else work doing our art now it's got to be you which i find yeah, it's super nice because a lot of this is like I get as much joy from building connections and meeting new people and doing all of that side of things as much as just, oh, draw a zombie, there you go, pay me money kind of thing. You know, it's yeah. meet, meeting, meeting people and hanging out and making new friends. That's the that's as enjoyable as any part of it. So so I, I, that, that, the personal connection is definitely a huge part because if I was difficult to work with, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't be I wouldn't be asked back. So yeah. Um, that's good to hear, man. And, and speaking of like inhuman condition, I know that first album definitely turned my head and I was like, oh, this is so cool with the, the corpses going up like the staircase. And we'll show that piece later. But I do love from a fan the consistency of it almost has like a story to it. And this new EP has a really cool effect where it has like the 80s kind of like old school. And he's like looking through like the shades um, and that that's either out or it's coming out very soon, I believe. Um, but the consistency of style from a fan's perspective is also very much appreciated. For sure. And I think you'll probably be the same as me with, um, I don't know, this is true for anyone from Morbid Angel to Iron Maiden, Megadeth, Death. At some point, they, for better or worse, normally worse, they've moved away from the artist that has cemented a kind of look about their albums like morbid angel for example a bunch the bunch, first bunch not blessed the sick but oh that's not the best example but you know obviously they had like dan seagrave with altars of, of madness and then he's gone back and done some of more, their more recent stuff and then all of a sudden you got like domination stuck there in the middle which i love that album it's my favorite morbid angel album but yeah. at the same time you kind of go how much better would that have been with the consistent style of the Seagrave stuff uh, that he was doing at that era? And I, and I think this is definitely true with like, you know, Megadeth and Maiden at some point, they moved away from getting Derek Riggs and Ed Repka. And I always feel like the albums are worse if it doesn't continue that or style of art or uh, death were different because I know they moved in a different style. And for me, they actually got better as they moved yeah. away from, but, but the, the 90s style art on human and uh, individual thought patterns and uh, symbolic especially it was really cool in its own way and it still suited the records even if it and i don't think thrashy death replica stuff would have worked on those album covers so that was a, a change that was good but for, certainly for someone like in human condition where you know what you're getting and i think half the thing is this massacre meets obituary and early death style it's going for a certain tone so yeah I've, I've chatted to jeremy about this as well that i think it's a really good idea to keep uh, a vibe going so fans such as just you know guys who like the band such as yourself might go sweet we've got another cover that continues a story continues a style and, and what have you yeah no i totally agree if we can just pause for one second the uh, audio is good but the video is kind of lagging a little bit do you mind bouncing out and then coming back in and seeing if that might fix it a little bit? Um, <laughs> but yeah, dude. Uh, so have you seen Inhuman Condition live yet? No, because they haven't played over here. Um, and I'm not going to go to the States to see them. But if they came over to the UK and assuming they played Scotland anywhere, I'd travel wherever to see them for sure. Dude, they're uh, live. Yeah, they I can imagine. You can decide. 
Oh yeah, of course, because there's there's a big crossover there now, given that Jeremy and Taylor have recorded the Deicide album, and mm-hmm. Taylor plays guitar in Deicide. So yeah, it, it's pretty cool that they um, got that. And, and Jeremy goes biking all the time with Glenn, <laughs> so, <laughs> which is just like you know, having grown up finding Glenn like this sort of guy that you read about in the magazines is a totally scary dude. So, to just imagine him going cycling with my yeah. friend. It's just the funniest <laughs> thing. That's <laughs> so, hilarious. But uh, he's had to. some interesting interviews lately. Glenn, uh, I don't know if you've checked him out, but they're worth watching. He's definitely, you know, mellowed out a bit. What were you about yeah. to say? Uh, yeah, I was going to say um, the cl- very quickly, the closest I got to seeing Inhuman was when uh, Left to Die came and played over here recently, which nice. is, yeah, which I've obviously worked for and I know all the guys in the band. And that's got Matt Harvey and Gus Rios from like, who's done Malevolent Creation and Gruesome. And I was on holiday in France snowboarding and I, I was gutted because that's as close as you're ever going to get to see from my age. As some, it's, it's as close as you're going to get to see death playing. All four of the guys in the band that I speak to, I would have been there under like any circumstance, but I booked a holiday. I'd already booked, you know, there was nothing that I could do and I was devastated about that. So if any of them are listening sorry guys but I've, yeah it was just i mean that's there's a kind of crossover there with inhuman given that rick has played guitar solos on the record and and terry's in both bands so i'd have loved to have hung out with terry because he's like he's death metal royalty you know given oh, yeah. that he's as anybody else ever plays in like death obituary his six feet under massacre now in human condition it's just he's paid his dues it's unreal man yeah so, but hopefully one day, and uh, and certainly if they get if they come over this way, I'd I'd see them, no 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 doubt. Nice. Shifting gears a little bit, I wanted to talk a little bit about your process. Then, so there's kind of almost two ways of looking at it. There's the process of more of the business, like the band reaches out to you, you you know figure out the rate, you talk about that thing. We could talk about that, but the other part I'm curious is a little more of the technical side. So kind of your sketching approval process. And I did read an interview a little bit about you start with Procreate, then you go to, um, is it Photoshop for like the final touches and really bring it all together? But yeah, do you mind kind of speaking on that? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, in the very, very early days and maybe up until 2018, I'd probably start off in pencil on paper and scan it in. But just the effort of that versus being able to do it on an iPad sitting mm-hmm. at home at night or whatever is it's just so much easier so i've started trying to use the ipad a little bit more recently on procreate to do a bit more of the guts and i'll get into why in a minute but typically what's happened is i'll i'll sketch it in a in a fake pencil a digital pencil on on procreate on my ipad and once it gets approval i'll i, I almost go straight into Photoshop and do all the heavy lifting in that because it's on a bigger screen, you know, instead of a 13 inch iMac, you're on a 20, sorry, a 13 inch iPad, you're on a 27 inch iMac. I like my brushes on um, my Mac and I've got all my music and, and what have you, but I've been going through reruns of parks and rec just in the background (laughs) whilst, whilst doing, whilst working on procreate. There's some American culture right there. Uh, that's right well it's just it's the sort of thing where i can just stick it on in the background and listen to it yeah. and work at the same time and my when i'm doing art my brain completely separates um, i can draw and listen totally well i can't type an email and listen my brain just like it oh, yeah, it's and just, but drawing and listening easy but in fact I, I would say i concentrate better if somebody's talking to me if i'm drawing at the same time because it's almost like i don't daydream because the part of my brain that would daydream is actually wrapped up in doing the art. So the listening part can absorb whatever I'm hearing. So anyway, I've, cause of, cause now I work from home and I'm now a full-time artist as opposed to working in an office. It's quite nice to just sit down with a coffee in a track suit or, or shorts and just in front of the TV and lie down on an iPad sketching as opposed to at a desk, sat in a chair and doing all that. So I'm, I'm doing a little bit more in, on my iPad at the moment, but still I would say most of it is done in, in Photoshop and I've got a super simple process. I'm, I'm one of these people where I like to, I have a thing. I learn 5% of it well, 
and that's me fine. So all of my amps and guitar tones and everything unrelated to art is like, find the sound you like and do it. And I don't need to mess around with all this other stuff. And it's the same with art. It's like I've got, I've got like four brushes that I use in Photoshop, like two or three in Procreate. And I don't use any, I don't really use any Photoshopping techniques these days. I did a lot, in, a bit more in my earlier days, but in order to kind of get a traditional look, uh, I find the more you just bring it back to basics and just treat it like a real canvas um, as, yeah, as closely same. as possible. And, and that's why, like, and it's nothing against digital art or digital artists uh, in any, in any, I mean, I am one. It's more that the art that I grew up loving mm. was traditionally painted. So the look and the aesthetic that I'm going for isn't that super clean, super shiny thing. It's a bit rough around the edges when you zoom in. And I guess it's like auto-tune. I don't, I don't have a problem with auto-tune, but I don't want to hear it. And I think it's like that with my art. It's like I've got nothing against digital art, but I'd like people not to necessarily... No, and I'd never admit, I'd never go, oh, you know, I'm not telling you what it is. Not in the slightest. It's more a case of I want somebody to look at it and just view it as a painting or, rather than wondering how it was done, I suppose. Um, I probably didn't make that come across quite as well as I'd have No, liked that's to. crystal clear to me. You draw it, most of your inspiration from traditional artists, so you're trying to have that effect, but you're using the convenience of digital tools. Exactly, because I yeah. flat out for for cost, ability, and any other reasons, space. I couldn't do and t turnaround time. I couldn't do what I was doing on a canvas, yeah. um, and I grew up doing traditional art because this didn't exist to me up until um, you know the, I guess the late two, the very very late two thousands, turning into the two thousand and tens. But it's just so handy to be able to sit at a computer, listen to your music, go. I mean, I press Control Z for the amount of times I make a mistake so often that that's better than getting out an eraser or painting over or something yeah. or what, ha what have you. And um, I guess it's just after 15, best part of 15 years of doing it like this, you get, you get stuck in a way that you really enjoy. And maybe at some point I'll go back and do the odd painting. But I think you just, you know, if someone wants a massive change, it's like just chuck it in the fucking bin, you know, whereas yeah. like now it's a case of, oh, yeah, sure. And, and, and I submitted a new cover for a band, a pretty small Greek band uh, a couple of days ago. And I was like, just give me one second. I just want to repaint this tiny bit. Like, um, I think that would drive me up the wall. Try to do that on a, on a canvas with paintbrushes. So I, I love the digital realm. And I loved I love a lot of digital artists as well, like um, ones that have a a typically more digital look so like i say i can't state enough it's it's nothing against that it's just the style i'm going for is basically what late 80s early 90s in in terms of vibe yeah. i guess so no, totally. wait for the wacom tablets yeah you were talking about the process and like it reminds me a lot of um the conversation i just recently had with uh, james balsama uh, do you know him i feel like he he mentioned that you guys have talked a little bit yeah, I love his work. He's probably my, f I think he's my favorite new artist. Um, yeah, he's mega talented and skilled, man. He's so good. Like, I've, he's got me checking out bands that I might not have done because of his covers. Again, like the Spirit World one that he did. I was mm -hmm. like, uh, and it's a brilliant record, and I'm glad I did. But I was like, I'm going to check it out because of Jane Bo Basma's, uh cover and i know he's done frozen soul and municipal waste and the new celestial sanctuary one but i love his work like i, I can't count him as an influence from a i didn't grow up seeing his stuff because he's 10 years well maybe not quite but a bit younger than me but in terms of inspiring now i see his stuff he's pushing you yeah oh man like i right to me and i'm buttering him up here i think he will be the next Aleran cantor in the sense that mm -hmm. give it a few years and just everyone will want his work because yeah. it's so good. And I, I prefer his work over my own. And I don't mean that in any sort of humble or modest way, because I think what he achieves is he gets an old school vibe where it looks like it's sort of traditional, but not dated necessarily to an era. It's like a, it's like an, it's like an rooted in the old school, but, just a little bit more modern and i don't know i love all of his covers i love everything that he does and we've we've had a crossover because we've both worked for pull the plug patches so he's actually mm -hmm. he's drawn some of my stuff that i've invented which is quite cool yeah, but, patchy, um, right 
patchy yeah that's right so so that was great but yeah sorry i, I interrupted i can't remember what you asked about uh him no but, yeah, no i was just that. saying like you guys i i see you um you both have your own styles i'd say yours is a little more um there's a little more humor in like yours just a little bit like at times and you have like a different like um kind of like clever kind of like approach to some things and he has a very like um classic and uh He's very inventive as well. I mean, I, I just see you guys as both being uh, different, but like you're like uh, kind of peers in that sense of being like digital painters who really draw a lot of influence from, um, you know, the traditional kind of stuff. So I just see some similarities, but you guys are, are different enough for sure. I just want to make sure that's clear. I just I like that there's a little bit of like a, a friendly competition there, you know, and you guys kind of have that connection i think that's really neat that's something that i think is fun in art because it makes everybody better absolutely. so i kind of come from yeah. that perspective i totally agree i absolutely love and I, you call it friendly competition i don't see myself in competition it's more a case of you see someone that's doing amazing stuff and it yeah. makes it inspires you to raise your game or uh just push something uh, in one way or another and m the best guitarist that i ever played with in any of my bands there was w like one in particular where um we'd make each other better by coming into practice and go dude check out this lick or let's what i've yeah. and then everyone gets better and i always i love playing with somebody that was better than me because it's like it, it inspires you and for it's not a jealousy or an envy it's the exact opposite for me it makes it makes everyone better right and and it's like it's not like there's five bands only going after one artist there's there's hundreds and me or him or canto or or, or many of the other brilliant guys out there that i love there's there's work going around for everyone so i i certainly don't see any it's, it's only a, it's only massive positives for me seeing these guys produce uh, work that i love it's, it's really great and i, I think we're in a that, good man. place we're in a good place now i think with art compared to where things were in if you look at that a lot of bad photoshopping and photographic covers with not much effort of the 2000s yep. era we're back to doing good proper metal covers which as a fan i love you know uh, it makes me want to buy cds again even though there's no point to them in in my house because i've run out of space and i can't play them yeah you're a fan of me man oh. No, I'm oh, just kidding. Do you I know, collect you know, them. No, no, I, I was saying there's no point to me buying CDs in the sense that I've got so many CDs that I don't know what, I've got no space to put any new CDs. Oh, so now that I, like, I, I've got, I can play them in my car, so I still buy the odd one. But like, I love CDs and I would advocate everyone buying them. But it's just that <laughs> I've, I've got bookshelves full of them, not in this room, downstairs, that like once once we started running out of space we had to sell the worst ones on like music magpie i don't know if that's a worldwide thing or just a uk thing where you know you get 5p for a cd but it's like well i'm never going to listen to that one again but we need space for the good ones that we're going to buy and bring in but um yeah like oh man i love cds and i think the goal as any artist is if you can make somebody buy a medium that there's not necessarily a reason for them buying that's like great success yeah good point very good point so you consider yourself a self-taught artist right oh uh, yeah fully yeah so then what was your method of getting to this level like did you have kind of a system or a process and i know like some of it's just you just do the work but like you have foundational principles in all of your work so you must be thinking about these kind of things can you kind of speak a little to that I honestly it probably just comes from loving stuff and trying to copy it because I never yeah. wanted to be an album artist. I mean, I did, but I also didn't because I thought that's a stupid career choice. Nobody would, you, how do you be one of those? So I, I didn't go to art school because I thought, well, being a somebody that's a concept artist for a computer games company or a heavy metal company, those aren't just things like, uh, oh, a lawyer or an accountant or a or a, right. or a chef or anything, you know, though, lots of people need lots of those jobs, whereas it's such a weird bespoke thing being a heavy metal album artist. So I never had any aspirations to do it with any degree of seriousness. So I just love I'm entirely self-taught from copying Iron Maiden or Megadeth pictures or Sepultura stuff or um 
pretty much that or making up something in my own head like i remember drawing a load of turtles like teenage mutant ninja turtles when i was probably seven or something um and you know if i get into something i like but it was always i guess it was always media you know film or tv or tv cartoons music it was never a case of oh i want to paint like uh van gogh or or leonardo da vinci style like actual art <laughs> you know art that art that non-metal fans would find value in <laughs> right so, right so like so i guess in terms of in learning uh, i'm better at learning if i just do it so people can try and teach me stuff and it doesn't i could understand the theory behind it but until i just do it through repetition myself I'm never very good at it. And it's the same, everything from cooking to playing guitar or anything that I have a degree of ability in. It's just from going, like I, I bought a guitar or I got a guitar for Christmas. I was like, what do we do? I was buy Megadeth and Metallica tab books and sit down for hours a day until you can play them. And then when it came to writing songs, you start off by badly ripping off other bands songs until you understand the foundations of what it takes to create a song that sounds a bit like Metallica or to bring this back to art, you, you do stuff enough. Like you maybe look at the lighting of certain um, artists or the perspective or what they do color wise in terms of having a big base color that dominates all of their covers. And I think for me, I've just picked and selected what I liked about certain artists, some more than others. And just, try to my best to do an amalgamation of that and i guess i've always tried to do stuff that i think would be good if somebody better than me could do it and it's the same with music as well playing guitar it's like all songs i'm going to try and write exactly the sort of music that i want somebody else to do but that doesn't quite exist and it it's come out as exactly uh, what it's come out and i think that's maybe why i've and you touched on it earlier i <sighs> I've got a variety of styles within a certain realm. It's not just everything looks instantly maybe like one kind of art. And it's because I've got quite a lot of influences and mm -hmm. I didn't get to do replica style stuff for ages. I, I always just wanted to work for thrash and death bands, but nobody asked me for a, a good few years of doing this. And then you can find your groove a bit. So, so yeah, it's just honestly just self-taught practicing doing stuff that you like simple as that what's like some kind of art skill that you're looking to improve this year like um lighting like i guess what what's maybe like a challenge that you might kind of put on yourself and i understand some of this is based off of what the client wants from you would present the challenge but do you have any kind of area of focus I mean, I think probably like most artists, there's a degree of self-loathing in anything you do. And so <laughs> yeah. in terms of like, it was like, how would you like to improve? It's like by getting better and not hating the stuff that, that you do. But, yeah. but I, I rational rationalize this by going normally at the start of most projects, I'm excited by it and I think it looks good. Yep. And then you spend enough time on it and go, I think it looks terrible again. But if you make it, if you spend 60 hours making something better than when you liked it in the first place, I've just got to trust that it's probably all right and that I'm just fatigued by seeing it. Um, but I still go in to every single project and it's like, can I still ride a bike? I, I, I worry with every single cover, can I still actually draw? I must have just fluked those last 20 or 50 or 60 covers or I was in a good groove. And most projects I find at some stage I'm going, oh shit, I'm so bad at art. I can't do this one bit. And then you find a way to get around it. And yeah. I, 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 you know, imposter syndrome is, is real. And I, I would love to know that if the artist that I love, whose work I think is amazing, who've hardly done ever anything rubbish at all. I wonder, I really wonder if they suffer from that thing as as well because it's it's a it's a total phenomenon because objectively i know i'm quite good at something because i've been asked enough to do it and people like it and the likes of yourself has asked me to speak about it but it's very difficult to process that in my own brain and like go in with fear for every job i hey man mm. i i can totally relate um so 
<laughs> that feeling of like, can I do it again? And like, were all those past ones a fluke? I feel that especially because I do, you know, traditional art. So it's almost like that one mistake can kind of like paralyze you and you have to start over. So I, I could definitely relate to that um, in that sense. And then in terms of, other artists that you respect have an imposter syndrome. I mean, I've had what about 13 of these conversations and to varying degrees, every person I've talked with has mentioned that. So you're not alone in that by any means. Yeah. Now, it's, it's, nice. Uh, it's nice to hear. <laughs> yeah. The only artist I can think of based off of interviews that I don't think had any imposter syndrome is like Frank Frazetta, who was like oh, confident yeah. out of the womb basically, but yeah. everybody else, I've ever like watched or read interviews or anything. They always had an element of it, but they just pushed through it. Like you're talking about, man. So much of it is that persistence and perseverance and, and believing in yourself. Yeah. And it's nice to hear that everyone's like that. And I get it for other things uh, as well. Like I go, I'm, I, I wouldn't consider myself an expert snowboarder, but I'm competent enough and have been doing it for enough years. And every year it comes to going on snowboard again, not, not during COVID. And it's like, can I, can I, can I remember how a snowboard and then, yeah. you know, you put it on and within seconds you're like, Oh yeah, it's all good. But I don't know if it's just a thing where I think if you've got a degree of um, uncertainty, it keeps you working hard, I suppose, and trying mm -hmm. to improve because I've never been one of these people, but I have known them, especially within the music scene that think they're God's gift. And yeah. often they're just mediumly talented and way inflate their own importance. And you know, they're folk that are never actually going to achieve any degree of success because uh, and by its success, I don't mean like fame or money. I just mean sort of any sort of thing tangible in terms of something they're doing, go where, going anywhere to the outer world because they get stuck in this bubble of the, I'm brilliant already. I don't need, to, don't need, to, I'm better than other people at stuff. I don't need to work hard for it. And if you don't work hard, you, like even the best people in the world, they keep working hard. And if you look at any of those athletes, like, uh, you know, from probably from Michael Jordan to Lionel Messi or whoever, like all of these people at no point do they go, I'm the best in the world. You know what I should stop doing is stop trying. And they're, they're the ones that are working even harder to maintain that. So yeah, I think, I think in a good way, doubting yourself and struggling with imposter syndrome helps you trying to make everything you can do as good as possible. You, you just got to balance it, you know, like, um, like I hope, and I mean this genuinely, you know, I, I, feel very strong about how strong your work is. So if you can go to sleep tonight and that boosts your confidence a little bit, I consider myself uh, a happy man because I think you deserve oh, it. But thank you. if everyone in the world told you that and you started becoming a little egotistical, I'd probably want to knock you down a couple pegs. So yeah. everyone kind of needs that, the compliments sometimes, but it's like a, you know, it's a balance meter, right? Yeah. So there are times when I'm feeling insecure about my work and when somebody gives me a compliment, it makes my day. And then if I get too much of that, then I start to like, and, and none of this is like tangible. It's all just in the head. I'm not saying these things. I'm not a jerk, you know, but they'll, they'll skew me to maybe think I'm better than I actually am. So you kind of, you lose perspective on where you kind of stand. So knowing kind of how much farther you have to grow and people being better than you, like you, we've kind of been talking about, that's what ultimately brings you up. So being future oriented is very important, but you have to be very satisfied in the present. Yeah, abs absolutely. And I, I think to add to that, for me, regardless of how um, I was ever perceived in terms of ability, I always know that mute art, any art, whether it's film, music, drawing, is so subjective to the end user. Yeah. And I don't have any arrogance in terms of telling people what is or isn't good. People can like whatever. If, 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 a comedian that I think is terrible and bland and rubbish appeals to you. I'm not going to say you're wrong for liking it because it's the same with all sort of art. You see some graffiti art that might be really simple, but it might just resonate with you in some way. Whereas for me on the flip side, and I do not want to in any way denounce the ability of these people, I find photorealism copies of an image really boring because it's the equivalent of, it's the, it's the equivalent of Pro Tools tech death where there's no songs where you go, it just sounds mechanical and doesn't generate any emotional response other than the technical aspect of it. And I absolutely admire to the hell out of people that have got the ability to just 
play incredibly on guitar or drums or or to to draw that makes it look like a photo but for me i don't necessarily get anything from that so with that in mind i absolutely know that even if i produce the best piece of art in the world there could still be 90.99.9 percent of the population that go i it doesn't appeal to me so therefore um you know i it it's not like running a race where you know that if you're the fastest, you're the best in the world. Whereas yeah. that's not that doesn't exist with art and it doesn't exist with music, which is why my advice to anybody is just just do what you love and therefore you can never fail. And if other people happen to like it, then brilliant. Um, and I think that's what I have always done and that probably comes across in the way that I talk about it. But it, that does, I think, keep you on a good keel because you just understand that like no matter how good or bad you do something like some of my worst covers for me are ones that people like the most and, and i did i did a jackson pollock kind of thing for haken it was the easiest piece of art i've ever done i just scribbled on an ipad in the car whilst my son my, my six month old son was asleep total garbage like just ah that'll do that'll do and someone said this i don't really like any of this artwork for fauna but i really like that love bite one uh, which is just a kind of me <laughs> me sketching garbage but it doesn't bother me in the slightest and if anything i love it because it might mean that other people prefer some of my art over other better artists and and that works for everybody and yeah. it means that there is no right or wrong and it keeps everything fresh and I, I don't know I get I get a big kick out of knowing how subjective music and art and that sort of kind of thing is films too it is it is, it is very interesting no that's that's cool man I I love your your mindset with all this stuff and, and I think nothing that's interesting and once again, I'm, I'm saying this from a sake of politeness, but like for her, the size of clients that you've worked on, your Instagram following is not that big. And I think that's really cool because it speaks to what you're saying. You're doing everything for the quality of the work and the joy of it and creating the best product possible. And you've developed these relationships with bands. So you're getting the work in that very um, relationship driven way. I don't know if you had any comments on that, but I was kind of amazed at kind of how small your following is, but I think it's a very loyal and tight following, which I think is really cool. Yeah, this comes from a few things. Firstly, I don't really do much social media. Um, I'm on it all the time, but I don't post unless I have anything to say. I, I read mm -hmm. a thing a long time ago. This is relating to Facebook and probably in an era of people posting their beans on toast for lunch. And that is that if you don't have anything, <laughs> If you want to say something to the world, it has to either be interesting or funny. And if it is neither, all it does is serve th yourself and right. it isn't really of value to anybody. And, and there's a bit of difference in that. If a family member has holiday photos or something, you can tell the difference between people that have posted holiday photos to share to the family versus, oh, look at me, I'm on a fancy holiday. Right. But exactly. I didn't, like, I worked as an architect for. 12 years just doing this as a bit of fun on the side so i never had any aims of turning into a career job and because i was always busy with it and a real job uh, <laughs> or an office job let's say i never had a desire to do facebook or instagram so it's only really in the last few years that so although i don't really have many instagram followers let's say i've also only got like 10 percent of the amount of posts that somebody of the level that I am operating in has. Right. But it doesn't bother me because the amount of likes that I get or the amount of followers that I have on any social media site, it doesn't, it doesn't at all dictate how successful a piece of art is, how successful I am as an artist. And I'm, for me, I think it's doing it about the right reasons. I'm going after, I'm just having fun doing the work and and i don't want this to sound like uh, somebody that's sort of justifying why they've only got like five thousand followers or something on facebook but it's a case of like content creators have got hundreds of thousands of uh, followers but mm -hmm. what they have to do is provide lots of short fire stuff that's interesting for 30 seconds but it's got no long-term value it's the sort of yeah. thing that amuses you when you're on the toilet or in between breakfast and don't get me wrong, I love all of that stuff because it passes two minutes a day every now and again. But I kind of think of it, 
the way that a band might write an album every five years and work their absolute hardest on it, I would much rather they did that than just churned out single after single to generate a wider following. So I would completely approach my social media following in that sort of way that I'd rather just say something when I've got something to say, post a cover when I've got to do, don't go after any wider, like don't go after hundreds of thousands of followers because that doesn't really mean anything. And the people that do follow me, it blows my mind. And I, I'm, I'm not really saying this to to name drop because that's really crass, but just as an idea, it's like, like the other day, Mike Amott from Carcass and Arch Enemy sort of followed me on Instagram and Dave Davidson from Revocation and a bunch of these other guys from bands. And I just sort of, I'll run through to my wife going, ah, <laughs> somebody I love. Hey, so, well deserved, man. Yeah, they, well, I, I'm only saying this like from a, a, a following point of view, it's much more handy to have a really small following but a high percentage of those people are the ones that would either buy your work uh, if you were to sell it or to give you work because they're an artist that you admire more than having 200,000 people. I mean, we've seen with the internet over the years, you can do a video of a cat laughing and it sound like it's laughing and it'll have a billion views and the world will love it. There's not a direct correlation between the amount. In fact, if anything, the, the more somebody has seen something, often the worse it is. Yeah. So... But it's an interesting thing in this day and age, and maybe I'd worry about it a bit more if AI art takes off or I'm suddenly not busy with work. But I've been, I've, I've never done a single personal commission in 15 years of doing this because I haven't had the time because I've always been backed up with actual work. So it kind you of goes to show. You haven't done any personal pieces in the last 15 years? Is that what you said? Nope. Not a single. I've done. I did a Paw Patrol couple, a couple of Paw Patrol ones during lockdown when my kids were young, just as sort of like an adult orientated Paw Patrol, just as a <laughs> mental break. Nice. And the closest I got was I recently did a logo for the Bangers and Mosh podcast, which yeah. I, I couldn't justify doing it because I had so much work and deadlines. But I thought I'm going to take an evening out and a morning out just to do something that I want to do because I love their podcast and. They see they seem like awesome dudes, and I don't get to, you know if they wanted an old school, an old death metal style logo, and I was like, I love doing that. It's not taxing, and if they don't like it, you can go and get somebody else to do it. So that's the closest I've ever had to do a personal project, and that's like one in in years. So, but well, I can't once complain. again grateful you're spending your time with me tonight. I know you got a lot of projects. You're oh, so, on, sorry, so thank that, you. That, that, I'm really grateful you're asking me. This was not remotely a hint. I've shut my work down for the night. I'll happily chat to you for however long you want to. Like that, that wasn't me hinting at I've got to get away and finish off stuff. It's just the, it's just the sort of, it's the sort of thing where, it, I, you know, you know, I, I could, I could almost work until whatever time, but I know at some point you've got to switch off and have a mental break. So for me, chatting to you, this is almost the equivalent of a personal thing that i'd like to do versus um you know just sitting and doing more and more and more work and yeah, uh, yeah. what's well, important man being an artist is a it's a lonely occupation in a lot of cases so i think it's important to talk with fellow artists that kind of understand you know they can talk shop a little bit but, albeit yeah. you know you're you're at a different level than me and i i i, I i'm totally aware of that but like i understand how art works i understand the struggle so it's very easy to you know, have a in-depth conversation. I really think it's valuable for everybody. So, absolutely, awesome. I totally agree. And that's one thing I've tried to do over the last few years is actually engage with more artists. And because I, I didn't for years and years, because I didn't consider myself one. It was more like somebody mm -hmm. who works a job and happens to do art on the side to earn a bit of extra money, and because some and because somebody asked me to, rather than trying to. But I've definitely over the last few years started to chat to really over the since lockdown um just started to chat to one or two more artists as and when they engage with me and then l love seeing all of their stuff because it's brilliant and inspiring I, and i try and start doing even more of that and I, I don't really care if somebody's worked with metallica or they've only worked with local bands that's not how i that's not how i judge a band and it's not how i judge a person so the whole levels or list of clients that that never really means anything to me. I like I like talking to people who are enthusiastic, and and I'd, I'd rather work for a band that are enthusiastic that have got five followers than one that have got five billion followers that send their merch department to come and ask for you because it's 
yeah, it's chatting to people like yourself and having a good laugh along the way. That's that's what gets you through <laughs> through life and happy and smiling and enjoying yourself, really, doesn't it? Totally, man. If you ever come to Atlanta for some reason, you got a place to stay. I'll tell you that. Oh, thanks, dude. I appreciate that. And and vice versa, if you decide to come up to Aberdeen, which not many people do, but yeah. <laughs> it's here. Uh, let's see. Yeah, we've covered on a lot of stuff. Um, yeah, really, we actually kind of naturally have covered a lot of these questions. But um, we'll, we'll show your work in a second. But anything else kind of top of mind you want to talk about that you're thinking about? Oh. I mean, I, it was just, this is, I don't know how many artists or what your key audience is, whether it's budding artists or existing ones. It's, it one thing, turns out to be mostly artists that watch this. So um, regular viewers, I, I hope they don't mind me sharing, like Lucas Shawgoth Kinetics watches pretty regularly. Um, Joda Cravo, Brad Moore, Mark Riddick, they're fans of the show, so they'll watch. Oh, and so sweet. they'll they'll probably uh, tune in and, you know, They've all kind of become friends, so it's cool. Oh, nice. Well, certainly the likes of Riddick doesn't need any <laughs> advice because he's, he's no, been apex. Mark's he's awesome. Been, yeah, he's been apex of what he does for however many years. I, I love yeah. his I love his stuff. Um, but it was just this is some unsolicited advice for if there's anybody out there. But I can't stress enough how important it is to just enjoy what you're doing and don't do it for other people primarily. Um, and it might be easy for me to sit here and say this as somebody that can reel off a handful of pretty big clients, but but it's only I've only ever got even there, which to me isn't that high up the ladder, by just having fun and enjoying what you do. And if and this is true for musicians as well, is if you just write music that is entirely for yourself and do art that's entirely for yourself, I think that in the long run makes you so much more happier. Uh, so much happier and also it means you can always look back and go you did stuff with integrity and you thought it was good at the time or maybe you still think it's good now and be happy with everything you've done and that's certainly the way that I approach absolutely everything and I would say it's a really valuable thing and so people don't get disheartened if no one's liking your work and you're not getting the clients that you are after or or what have you I'm not saying it'll come it might very well not come, but I could get no big bands for the rest of my life and I'd die happy because I just enjoy doing the stuff that I get, even if it's for small bands. And if I didn't get work for small bands, I'd just do personal pieces like I did when I was a kid, you know, um, yeah. reimagining an album cover just for something. So, and I think if you have that mindset, there isn't such a thing as failure um, because to me, su success is just doing things that you enjoy and being happy and content within yourself rather than going i've got this car i've worked for this band i've got this many followers all the kind of stuff that doesn't really matter and, and i've probably touched upon that for the previous hour as in when we've been speaking but it really is an important thing that's worth hammering home and uh I don't know, even if one person hears that and goes, yeah, sweet, I feel better about that. I'll keep doing what I want. Then... You got me. You got me yeah. on board. No, excellent advice. It it reminds me a little bit of, um, I, I watched a couple of Rick Rubin interviews recently. He's done kind of like a, a, he's doing a bit of a podcast tour right now. And he talks a lot about that. He's like, create for you. That's where true creativity comes from. That's where true joy comes from. Uh, I think Rick Rubin, um, although, you know, not everybody likes all the albums he worked on. I think from a mindset perspective and understanding psychology and how to get the best out of people, it's very much worth watching those interviews or listening. Like, I, you know, when you're working, you know, uh, creating your paintings and stuff, if, if you listen to any podcast, please check out, um, just search Rick Rubin on YouTube. And yeah. like, I, I think it's very motivational stuff. Him and uh, uh -huh. I've also been listening to some Todd McFarlane interviews of uh, yeah, yeah. Spawn. And Born Image and, Comics, yeah. Yeah. I've been um, really on a kick of kind of hearing him talk and his methodologies and everything. I think he's such an interesting character. I, I've never heard him speak, but I certainly I hadn't thought about Todd McFarlane in ages. But his, I never read Spawn or anything like that. But 
I was mad into like that style around when Iced Earth, the band, did yeah. darts. They did a cover with Dark Saga that had Todd McFarlane on, and I'm pretty sure did he do the like the Freak on a Leash video? He or, did, or yeah, he did. He won a Grammy for that actually. And then uh, the Follow the Leader covers the Todd McFarlane as the well. F- Follow the Leader, and I'm sure I've seen a bunch of his like figurines for like Hellraiser and all of that sort of stuff yeah. over the years. So he's not somebody that I would go. Oh, he's an inspiration, but when i think about it actually i wouldn't reach for him but now you mention it it's like yeah i love all the stuff that he's done over the years so thanks very much i'll check that and obviously rick rubin's done i know probably everything from bc boy slayer chili peppers and yeah death magnetic not so good but like, you know he's done so many good things over the years that, and he definitely seems like a method guy rather than a technical guy exactly. so like a bit like ross robinson i think was probably a bit similar in, in that era for just trying to maximize the potential of people sometimes with fairly extreme methods but <laughs> yeah to, to, here's a chair take Orange, that in the yeah. face yeah but if you i'm sure a lot of those bands weren't grateful at the time but they probably uh reaping the rewards from being asked to do something um a little bit out there at the time so thanks man i do like the odd podcast when i'm uh working away so i'll definitely i'll, I'll get on that after this well not after this because it's bedtime but you know <laughs> tomorrow perfect now well let's show some of your work can you see that okay yeah yeah all right so i got two things here we have the new corpse grinder cover on the left and then we have the um milwaukee metal fest mascot character i have the original that was not done by you that's below i had it as like a sort of reference but yeah let's start with the uh, corpse grinder yeah. if you don't mind can i tell me a little bit about maybe how this commission came to be how you created it i'm curious if you got corpse grinder to actually pose for reference for you i got some questions <laughs> but you you go ahead and start yeah. Sure. Well, this this one's I've done a few things for Jasta, which I mean, as a massive fan of Hatebreed, I like oh, his awesome. podcast. When I, I saw he started following me ages ago on Instagram, but I thought maybe something will happen, maybe not. What a stand up guy. Yeah, for sure. And he give he, he gives me shout outs on his podcast, which means every now and again, if I've done something for him, which means the world because he doesn't have to, and he does he reps other bands all the time. I think he's doing he's doing the Lord's work. So sh- shout out to Jasta for being yeah. like a heavy metal god, man. He's done that enough for me. But he messaged me and he was like, "Oh, hey, man, I need some. Uh, uh, do you want to do the Corpse Grinder cover?" And I was just blown away because it's like somebody that I really like asking me to do one of the absolute best extreme metal but i love cannibal corpse and i love corpse grinder oh, he's yeah. probably the best he's up there with my favorite not my very very favorite but he's right in the top three or five extreme vocalists of all time but objectively he may be the very best in that sense so to Legend. get to work on this was amazing and they and this so so with this cover you know they asked me to do it and what the brief was something like a corpse grinder fighting a bunch of zombies. So I was like, (laughs) yeah, that sounds sweet. Um, And I, I didn't, I'd knocked up a rough sketch and I, I, funny enough, just this week I realized there's a little thing that bugs me about this. And that is the anatomy of the left arm. Isn't quite right. Yeah. And the reason that is, is we not the 11th hour, but deep into the project, we, changed the sketch of he was originally holding an axe and swinging it Um, but i'd done so much that i wanted to keep it uh what i had done um but without losing all the like dozens and dozens of hours of work and the schedule so i managed to kind of rework the arms to be no weapons and ripping the zombies heart out but i didn't get any reference poses from george nor did i ask i He's on the internet. There wasn't actually that many good ones, really, because typically what you find with faces, and I don't know if you've ever noticed this, you might know exactly what somebody looks like until you want to draw what you think they exactly look like. And no photo exists. Yeah, because you people that lighting are like, right and all that shit. Th- that's right. So I, it's not 100% likeness, but it's, it's close enough to be recognizably him, apart from the billion people that just go, oh, it's Nathan Explosion from... Metalocalypse <laughs> without realizing that Nathan Explosion. I'd never seen Metalocalypse. I know about it, but Nathan Explosion was based on Corpse Grinder yeah. and and Pete it's Steele. Just, it's just so, a loop. It's that's just, just a feedback so, loop. Yeah. So it's uh, so that it doesn't wind me up, but it's one of those ones where I wish that 
I wish there was a sort of thing, a bot that would come onto my uh, Instagram or Facebook that anytime somebody goes, Nathan Explosion, it just sort of triggers a, a Wikipedia page to link them. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> That's great. But um, And the other thing about this was, it was this cover was originally in a swamp. It was originally green and purple. Uh, so much of this cover was different, but um, George wanted it in this orange and yellowy apocalypse thing and i never really do orange and yellow covers you may or may not have noticed this but i'm so glad he did because i the change of the setting to an apocalyptic city um makes it looks better than a swamp and the colors worked well so we actually went through quite a few changes of this more yeah. than i took more than i do for most of my covers but i'm always open to ideas and i want to primarily i i want to be happy with what i've done myself but I do it for the band that's asked me to do this. And if they're happy, that makes me happier than me being happy with it, you know, because because I'm yeah. I'm too close to it. So I don't know what's good. So if they think it's good, great. And they and they loved it. And uh Jast had sort of mentioned a bunch of times it's like, dude, I've got this massive poster hanging up on this on the wall behind and it makes me so happy every time I see it. And it's like, oh, dude, that's awesome. <laughs> dude, that's that's so cool, man. And um it also you know, you're talking about all the changes and stuff, and those are some pretty drastic changes. It, it does showcase the strength of working digitally because as a, as a, you know, watercolor, gouache, colored pencil, like I do everything traditionally, like all that stuff would be a nightmare. Like, you know, trying to make changes like that that are that drastic that late in the game. Yeah, absolutely. That's um, cool. Yeah, I didn't know if you want to speak. The one on the right was obviously – what I try to do at the top was a hundred percent copying the vibe of the one at the bottom right, but mm -hmm. just doing it in the way that I would do. That was the that was the brief. And I've done a few things for Jasta, one that's not been released or announced uh, yet. But I also did the Tim Ripper Owens um cover that he got me on board for that one as well. So there's a handful of things that he's asked me to do, um, including the Milwaukee Metal Fest, and I didn't really think anything of it, but I'm sure probably if you're on social media at all in any capacity, when that thing was kicking off, you just see it everywhere. As every band was sharing that sort of face that I did in a, yeah. in a day or two, which was mad, you know, especially because the list of bands on that bill were incredible. So it was fun seeing that next to like Lamb of God and Anthrax and, and all that. But um, yeah, it was just, that was just a, that was just a fun little side project. That I didn't really, didn't realize it was going to turn into what it actually turned into. No, it's cool. It that one definitely channels some more Repka vibes. The lighting on the side of the face with the red, that's definitely kind of a little Repka ish. And I mean that in a, in a compliment way, of course. I, think. I mean, you could compare my work favorably or unfavorably to Repka, and it would not offend me in the slightest because I know, I know where my influences lie. And it's, yeah. I've always just done stuff like that to the point where whether I want to or not, it'll come out like that. And a lot of it's, like you say, it's the red lighting. One of the most staple things of the work that he's done is this kind of, not quite a rim light, but a side light coming yeah. off camera that's purple or red or blue. And that has always been something I've loved and tried to bring into my art wherever possible. Um, it's difficult working with making up multiple light sources, but oh God, yeah. <laughs> you, you hack it until it looks all right. That's, that's the, my process. <laughs> <laughs> feel you there man i was talking about that with uh another guest the other day about like multiple light sources in the challenge especially when you're dealing in color and not just you know black yeah. and white or black and gray so i wanted to showcase this um because you did these between the ages of 12 and 14 and you know you're talking earlier about learning by studying and like man i mean your uh, proportions are pretty dang spot on for your age. Like, it, I don't know. I just feel like you just had a natural gift. And I'm not one of those guys who's like, oh, you're so talented. This didn't create any like hard work. Like, I know how much hard work has taken you to get to the level you're at. But I do think you can just see here that you did have a natural eye for like knowing when something is on and off. And yeah, these are far from perfect, but pretty dang impressive for your age thanks uh, i would probably describe myself as somebody whose um standards and eye for something is better than my ability if that makes sense so yeah a lot of the time i have to hack at something until i know it looks okay whereas 
you know, I see a lot of these, especially traditional painters, they can make minimal brush strokes look incredible and paint detail with three brush strokes because they have got that. I don't have that in my locker at all. And in the nicest way possible, I'm super envious of somebody that can make sl not sloppy. That mark making ability. Yeah, a rough brush stroke and they paint detail out of nothingness. I can't do that. But like you say, yeah, it's just a case of studying stuff. And they're not perfect, but obviously I also was a, a young teenager when I did it. But it was a case of I got the live after death cassette. It was one of the earliest ones I get. What am I going to do? Go home and try and draw it. And uh, they're at least close enough that you can go, oh, that's that's a good approximation. But just going back very quickly, I've always drawn ever since I was two or three years old. So even when I was even when I was seven and eight, I would say probably relative to my age, I was probably a better artist then than I am now. If I see, like I remembered some of the drawings that I did when I was really, really young, not of metal covers because it was before then. And it, that stuff was good. So I think it was, and even these pencil drawings a little bit, because I don't really do that much traditional stuff. It's like, oh my God, if, imagine if I tried to draw it now, would it be worse than the stuff that I did 25, 30 years ago? But I wouldn't know until I try it. But it always... I think seeing stuff you do when you're young, uh, the, even if it's of an okay quality, it's it's nice to know that it, you came from a place of art ever since you were a kid because yeah. you do forget what happens in the intervening years. But but thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you've shown these up because I, I discovered them in an old fo folder um, a little while back when we were getting some building work done and I posted them on social media just because it was like, oh, this is, it's cool that I'm now, okay, I'm not working with Slayer, Megadeth and Maiden, but um, I have worked with some of the bands that I used to, do you know doodles of when i was a kid which is great fun hey man maybe eventually yeah well I've, i mean i did a picture of billy from biohazard when i was 13 because they were like my favorite i, think I saw it was too i considered putting that on the slide deck but i kept with these three your rise uh, uh cover was pretty good too thank you well as, and I've done... if you look at a distance yeah. the roots look spot on it's only when you look up close that you can kind of tell a little the inconsistency. yeah you can see that it's colored pencil and you get close up but i i don't know if you saw it but i got to do the i've re, i've done the roots shirt for actual sepultura which oh, is that, that that's awesome yeah yeah and i'm i'm doing a, another shirt for them at the moment and um that's just that sort of okay i know it's not max era max 1991 arise sepultura but it's still a huge name and people that i would call my heroes so that's that's really cool and same with billy from biohazard i love that band so much and he's a good dude so chatting to him on the phone was just like ah, i can't i kind of like i wasn't doing stuff for biohazard it was one of his other bands but it was still just uh very humbling and i had to pinch myself a little bit just because he i mean my mom might not know who billy graziardi is but i know and have known for since i was that high who he was so that means super Tons, yeah, means super much amount to me. Ugh. Mangle that sentence. Hey, man, you're in good company. Uh, but, I mean, just really cool to see where you came from. So let's talk a little bit about some of your Haken pieces. Sure. Um, yeah, you, I'll let you go ahead and go for it. Right, well, this... Uh, I mean, my favorite bands were Metallica, Megadeth, and the usual Death and Carcass and all that stuff, but in terms of my what I would describe as my favorite band now, it's been Haken since 2016. And I've, before I got the Haken job, I did the Tiktalica stuff with Charlie, who plays guitar in Haken, for anybody who doesn't know that. And he randomly followed me on Instagram about nearly two years ago. And I didn't have as many people who I look up to follow me at that time, but he was literally my favorite, like the favorite band. Uh, they're, they're from the UK as well and a bit smaller. So I kind of thought he might actually respond and also be a bit more humbled if I message him out of the blue and say, hey, man, I love your band, given that he, he followed me. And it yeah. turns out he'd heard Terry Butler go on the JASTA podcast and mention my work in human condition, which this goes to show you how important and how much it means when people give artists credit. Yes. And he, he, and he was like, oh, if this person is a bit like Ed Repka's style stuff, well, just check out his work. So I just happened to casually in this coolest, like I DM'd him on Instagram and I was like, oh, hey, man, I just wanted to say thanks for following me. I love Haken, by the way, and keep up the good work. It was just, you know, yeah. simple as that. And we got talking over one evening and at some point he, I followed him on Facebook 
and he'd done this acoustic cover of Seasons in the Abyss by Slayer. So I just happened to say to him, I was like, oh, no way, man. I I thought I, years ago, a couple of years ago, I wrote this the lyrics to a uh, Christmas version of uh, a yeah, Slayer song. Yeah, you were in like a band, right? Exactly. And he yeah. was like, we have to do this. And I sort of was like, man, it's like, you can't be joking about, I didn't say this, but I was thinking, you can't be joking about this. I was like, are you being serious? You want me and you, the guitarist for my favorite band, to do a Slayer <laughs> Christmas cover? It's like, this is dreams come true stuff. And he was like, yeah, we have to do it. And he's like me in the sense that just super enthusiastic about things. If you enjoy it, you'd love it. So we spent months going back and forward, like, rewriting lyrics and working on motifs and he i because he's an amazing musician he was in, de in charge of the riff writing and the uh the structuring and i did some of the orchestrations to side of things and and we just bounced things anyway with doing the slayer stuff he was like i need an artist for my solo i'm coming up do you want to do it and i appreciate i've spent five minutes here not talking about haken but um so i said yes i did that cover we got them great and then when it came to the new haken stuff the rest of the band i don't think they were too keen on getting me to do it because they see my work and it was like we don't want zombies and heavy metal thrash style stuff that's not our band and i would be the first to admit i didn't want to do a haken cover because i don't I want the band to represent themselves exactly how they should be and let the appropriate artists do that. But Charlie was like, no, 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 he can do like, he can do other stuff as well. You know, just let's see what happens. And because of this one, they wanted a much more complicated, busy, um, it's not 70s prog rock, but more like the kind of, uh, like sort this of whimsical. Dude, I'm, man, it's like bringing back childhood memories. Sorry to interrupt you, man. There was oh, like this book that was like all the like, um, you know, like the I Spy books where it's like you see this and you're trying to find something. There was one that had all animals in it. And that's what that's reminding me of. Do you oh, know what cool. I'm talking about? Uh, no, I know the sort of thing. I don't know the exact one. It was but like I know the anim was... Animalaniac or something. Man, I got to find that. Oh, but that's what yeah, it was reminding me of. Go ahead, well, though. Sorry. So Yeah. No, so to, to get onto this, it's like I think he probably sold me um, – to the guy he sold the band the idea of me doing this and then i knocked up a quick sketch um it's super rough i'll maybe post it to social media one of these days it really is hilariously rough and they were like cool concept wise we love that and ross the singer gave me this huge document that was really super useful about uh, all the lyrics um or the first draft of the lyrics they sent me the demos of the album and an explanation of what all songs were about and I had so much information to work with that I basically just immersed myself in the whole idea of what we were going to do. And there's a lot of things linked to Richard, the other Henschel, the other guitar players, uh, dad passing away and other interesting stories being weaved throughout. And it's like, I, I say, I love all that stuff. I don't like family members passing away, but I love all the, the depth that you were getting out of all these individual songs and having each song represented by a different animal to me was fascinating and and when we came up with the idea of a, a victorian era monkey in a suit sitting behind a floral wallpaper with a bunch of easter eggs relating to other haken albums song titles i was like this is exactly um what i love and i got to do something that was a little bit different i think it's still possibly recognizable as my work if you were to compare it to other work but it obviously doesn't have the same typical lighting or thrashy death 80s 90s style uh, art it's, it's just very it's different just a, it's just a piece and i think a lot of fans for haken weren't entirely sold on the overall art direction when the singles were being released because as you've shown some of the other bits mm -hmm. uh, next to it not there. the thing on the far right but the yeah, two in the middle there the two in the middle they because it was so different than the cover. But at that point, they hadn't understood the conceit of the whole album, if anybody's got the physical packages. These were to be paintings within paintings. So once you frame those single covers and put them on the same wall in that room, all of a sudden you can have different art within art. And... I did a sort of Van Gogh take the mick, uh, not a, sorry, a parody or a pastiche of his piece. I did a, 
um oh the the campbell soup tin uh, the name escapes me andy warhol soup tin parody a um jackson pollock and all of this uh, a, um, a cubist picasso piece all of this ridiculous yeah. different style bits of art but once you stick them in a, a, a golden frame and put it throughout the art all of it all of a sudden it made sense and i think all of the people that weren't all the fans that weren't necessarily sold on the different styles of art understood when they got their vinyl through the post and were like ah this is why it is all all different um and just very quickly that like <laughs> prog that, fans am i right <laughs> exactly yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for real man but it, it's not exactly in his style but that blade runner uh, unicorn piece uh, for the alphabet of me single was inspired by oh uh, one of the polish artists not Beksinski or marius Lewandowski, darius sawodski who mm -hmm. does and if and i'd urge anybody who just likes art to check out his work if you can spell it off my pronunciation because he does all these amazing side portrait steampunk i think i know what you're talking about weird yeah. They could be death metal covers, and I'm pretty sure some of them have been used as maybe black, ambient black metal covers. But he's just an incredible guy. And I don't have that ability in my locker, but I just wanted to get this out there that that was the inspiration for that piece. Um, along with a sneaky court somewhere in, uh, somewhere in time Easter egg for the eye thing <laughs> that he's got going on, which Eddie's got on somewhere in time cover. That's oh. a, there you go, it's a little Iron Maiden Easter egg there. And the song, yeah, the song from the that it's about is well, sorry, the song "Alphabet of Me" is about Blade Runner. So there's the unicorn, and the, and the song mentions rattlesnakes in the lyrics. So you'll see little there's Easter eggs within single covers as well. So there's there's plenty for people to digest if they care enough about the band to examine all the little bits. Oh, that's super cool, man! And this is one where I I didn't know you did it until I was digging more, and I was like, wow, because I I heard so many positive remarks about this cover and it's a whole different fan base than what you're used to so you kind of got exposed yeah. to like the prog rock fan base versus the metal fan base and they value different things for sure and, and i i love my prog as much as i'd like my death metal so it, it's nice to do that but um I, it's not necessarily a question that you've asked or i don't know if you were going to ask but if i had to choose a, a cover that i think i'm I think is most successful in terms of for me in terms of the achievements of what i got with the finished product this one i think would probably be it because it's quite unique and other people have said oh it looks like a sewing cover or uh, uh whatever else but i can i can say hand on heart this piece was influenced by nothing really as far as no other album covers no other artists it was mm -hmm. just entirely based on me drawing based on the uh, information I'd been given about the songs. And so it wasn't a tech, like people mentioned that it was like the Joker suit from Batman. I didn't even realize that it, it was a different color of suit. <laughs> I didn't even realize <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I didn't know that. So when people go, oh, it's the Joker suit from, uh, you know, whatever it's like, it actually wasn't meant to be. It was more inspired by um, like Hugh Hefner. <laughs> 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 That's the so truth yeah like so so it's really it's always funny when like i'd be the first to put my hand on heart and say exactly where all of my art is uh inspired by or influenced by but it always makes me funny when people say oh nathan and explosion or such and such a cover that wasn't even on my radar when doing something yeah. but you know it's very difficult to be original uh and good you know you, you it's easy to be original but rubbish but it's not <laughs> difficult to be original True and, that. yeah yeah so um, and just i guess quickly the the love bite one on the far right was my semi homage to vince lock um of doing all the cannibal corpse art it's not exactly like that but it was more of a watercolory uh, yeah. color pencil type one Is which that I did a shirt a design yeah it was a shirt design and it was also used on the single because the single is a prog rock love ballad but with brutal lyrics about the mating rituals of the black widow spider so we just thought it'd be funny to have this it, like cannibal corpse style um artistic uh 
sort of visualization to effectively almost a Phil Collins style, a Phil Collins Toto prog ballad. Because <laughs> like, who's done that before? Nobody. <laughs> Probably with good reason, but it was, yeah, super fun. So anyway, that one's to Vince Locke. Love his work. He's a good dude. Oh, that's awesome. Is he is he British? I'm trying to remember. I think he must be. He's got to be American. I've never checked, but he's American. I I, I'll look yeah. it up. But um, yeah, I think "Love Bite" on the new album is actually my favorite track. But it's it's a very strong album. Um, I know you're like close with the guys. I think all their albums are good. Do you have like a, a favorite? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I I'll need to take Fauna out of the equation just because of my personal <clears throat> ties to it, but. Even with that in mind, I think Affinity will always be my favourite because it was the one that got me into the band. I'd heard them um, in 2013 when The Mountain came out when a friend of mine said, dude, check out this band. And I also read it, got a, a good review. And I listened to it and I didn't, I didn't dislike it. I just didn't love it. And it was because I think I was expecting prog metal not yeah. prog rock. And I love Yes and Genesis and Rush and and stuff like that. So it wasn't, it's not that, oh, everything has to be heavy and brutal. It was more that my expectation was it was going to be heavy. Right. And it had, and it doesn't have metal riffs. It's got moments of heaviness. And with Cockroach King being so early in the album, that is a real song that you get into, once you get into it, you love it, but it's not necessarily one that you would like instantly and i think i was just expecting more dream theater heavier dream theater star shredding anyway fast forward a few years and my same friend was like dude check out the new haken album you will love it and he instantly plays the song 1985 because he knows that i like sort of synth wavy style stuff and yeah mega 80s stuff and there was the metal riffs there was the transformers style build up in the middle and all of a sudden i fell in love and i played that album to death and i still love it so affinity for me and i love the aesthetic with that old cassette type uh cover for like 80s style thing and with the it was not a neon grid because they didn't do it in that coloring but with the grid and the sun and it, i just thought it was perfect and it just spoke to me and that album was like this is music designed for my personal tastes and then i i love vector when it came out i love um that's really consistent. And nil by mouth is just like kind of sugar, just taken to more listenable levels of awesomeness. Um, and, and I love sugar, but Meshuggah's, uh, it's not easy listening, let's say. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a bit more claustrophobic, whereas that was taking that idea, but chucking in the prog and the metal wrist with it. And then I love, virus as well and i've gone back to all of their albums ever since and i love the mountain now i can't state that enough but it was that was the last one it took me to really get my claws into um and genuinely love it and it was just over time because thing like music that's so complex reveals itself to you a little bit later and i think with fauna I, i'd be i'd almost call somebody a liar if they loved it on the first listen because it is so there's so much depth to it that I can understand if you'd like it on the first listen, but it's the album that blows people's minds after 10 listens. And then all of a sudden yeah. you, you understand. I'd, I'd be interested to get your, in fact, yeah, please give... hit me with all of your thoughts on Haken and Fauna and everything like that. Cause I'm, I'm doing the talking here. No, I so, mean, it's cool. I, I like the new album a lot. I mean, for me, the only like uh, thing that, took a little bit of getting used to i think really is the fact that all the tracks are quite different sounding but i like yeah. the um and yeah obviously i'm like a big metal head but i really like that kind of prog pop stuff like tears for fears and talk yeah. talk and yeah, yeah. i think they incorporated a little bit of tears for fears and if i mean you're a musician i'm a musician like creating a good pop hook is harder than shredding yeah. So definitely. they are challenging themselves with songwriting now that I feel like is is the next level, and that's where you graduate to. So I thought Fauna, um, I think that might be my favorite just because of the variety, and then the pop parts hit really well. Um, and then I think 1985, uh, that, that album's probably the, the other one that really is good. And then The Mountain, I mean, I'm a big prog fan as well so cockroach king like when i first heard that i was like this is like barbershop quartet 
yeah. you know, like kind of crazy little Devin Townsend in there. So, yeah. Um, I mean, Haken's awesome. My wife, uh, huge fan. Uh, maybe after uh, we stop recording, I can bring her in. And she can just meet you real briefly. But, man, um, great band. And I think they just keep getting better and better. And I hope that they are, like, the big headliners eventually. Like, I wish that for them. For, for me, they are one of very, very few bands that has done as many albums as they've done. Well, like, seven now. And... They do not have a weak album in the discography. And no. every album is somebody is lots of people's favorites. So nobody I've got three bands on my list and they've all got seven records. And that's Death, Haken, and then the punk band Propagandi, who I, I love that if you look at their discography and, and there was a list, you, you will just get arguments in anything because every album could be someone's favorites and no consensus rubbish album. So they just they like I love Dream Theater, but Dream Theater have done some bad albums. <laughs> and I, I love Metallica and Megadeth, you know, favorite bands of all time. But they have done some bad albums that if if you were talking to me and you were like, "Dude, you like Metallica and Megadeth," and I was like, "Yeah, the world needs a hero and Lulu," you know, it's like yeah. you probably you probably would realize quickly that we don't have much in common. But if I speak to somebody and they like, about Death or Haken and they sort of go, "This is my favorite album," I was like. It doesn't matter that your favorite is my least favorite, or vice versa. There's no wrong answer, so that's that's great, and I can't wait to see where they go from here because they're not necessarily a band. That, apart from the Vector Virus thing, they've never done the same album twice, so Correct. everything's always been a departure. So who knows where they go? Maybe back to metal, maybe poppier, maybe. I, I, I can't. I haven't asked them, and I almost don't want to because I'd like to hear the surprise for myself as and when that time comes. Oh, that's awesome. So it's a little side tangent, if I may. With Metallica, have you seen uh, some kind of monster, the documentary behind St. Anger recently? No, I haven't seen it since it came out. Dude, <laughs> I, you I, should I, watch that. It's so funny because it's like a Y2K like time capsule, man. It's yeah. so funny in hindsight. I, I still it's have... Spinal Tap, dude. It, it is, isn't it? And I like I James Hetfield was my absolute hero. If you look at any, I had a black Explorer, sprayed it all, scratch plate black, long wristbands. You know, I wanted to be James Hetfield ever since I was <laughs> a kid. But when he sort of slams the door like he's a petulant child, almost to yeah. sort of like, and almost peeks back at, like it's not, I'm making this up here, but almost peeks back in to make sure everyone saw him slam the door. It's like, no, my my, <laughs> hero, my heroes are big babies. And, oh, and I just, it like, it was fascinating. And I think I should revisit it, but it's Dude, one of those ones. Do it yeah. and then message me. <laughs> I will do it. I'll need to do it. I've got it on DVD because, you know, like everything Metallica did up until very, oh, very recently, yeah. I bought it instantly. But uh, that, that's only ever had one watch in my household. So I'll revisit it. Yeah. Oh. And if you ever get a Metallica commission, I hope this, you know, it was me who brought that up. So <laughs> yeah. put it on me. <laughs> on him. Yeah. All right. Will do. All right. Cool. We've been talking a lot about these guys. Um, if I may, I want to talk a little bit about the time that I saw them live. So opening for yeah. Deicide, and like, I I like In Human Condition, but their live show really sold me. Like, uh, so what's the front man's name? Uh, Jeremy. Jeremy, that guy brings it, man. He yeah. has so much energy on stage, and he comes like his approach reminded me a little bit of like hardcore, where it's like everyone's got to move. I'm gonna act like nuts, and I'm gonna get everybody going, like. He is a very solid front man. I was very impressed. And um, if it was just, if it was just a guy, you know, playing guitar and doing the vocals, and it wasn't as energizing, I wouldn't be as sold. But like, if you get the chance to see them, they are trying to like really make an impression every show, and that that hit home for me. I'd I'd, I'd love to. I mean, I love Jeremy a bit. So he's I speak to him all, all the time. Um, and what I love about his vocals as well, I haven't seen him live, although I've seen footage, but he enunciates words really well. He's one yeah. of the clearest death metal vocalists I can think of. He's still got that guttural power that exists in the same realm as John Tardy and Corpse Grind. I'm not comparing him to that. You know, as in someone that's got a, it's a sort of mid, a mid range rather than a, a low grunt or a high screech. I hear the Tardy a little bit in the, 
in some of the things, yeah. But but also like for how brutal Corpse Grinder is, you can hear what he is saying a lot of the time. And that's kind of how I'm almost comparing him more than the actual tonal quality. Or early um early ish Nick Holmes who was in Paradise Lost yeah. and Bloodbath and like uh, like uh, the early like this first couple of Paradise Lost records when it's more Death Doom style. It's like you can hear everything that Nick Holmes says. And I love that. Like, I think it's really good because it means you connect with the lyrics more. You don't need to sit through the, the sheet. Um, but sorry, yeah, I'm, I'd love to see him live. And I, I can imagine because he's, he's, he's the sort of guy that gives a hundred. Those Him and Taylor, the guitar player, who's also in days are like the hardest working dudes I've ever seen in terms of they've got so many projects on the go, uh, constantly doing stuff. They never stop. They, yeah. they're so prolific. It's amazing. So, um, and, and a high quality as, as, as well. So I'm glad that I'll, I'll definitely, if they come over here, I'll, I'll see them live for sure. In terms of these covers. So do you have a name for this character that is like recurring? He's, uh, he's just called the rat god because the rat god cool I the like rat that. god named after the first album cover um which was called rat god uh and the inspiration for him was uh is that a richard the, corbin reference didn't he have a comic called uh rat god or am i getting mixed up oh he might do but that you'd have to ask jeremy who came up with it for him i mean i'd quite like him to have a different I'd have liked him to have had a different name in like kind of a tangible character name, but it's stuck. So that's, that's what it's called. So I'm, I'm totally fine with that. But the inspiration for him was like Willem Dafoe and uh, that's, <laughs> uh, um, that's great. W Willem Dafoe, Norman Bates character in psycho. Yeah. Um, and the concept of, um, Oh, Oscar Wilde's, Dorian Gray, the idea that somebody goes and the, he doesn't, he does a bunch of bad deeds, but he doesn't feel the effects physically, but a portrait in his attic ends up getting decayed and horrible. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So what we've got with that first cover, if you see how grisly he looks in the mirror, it's almost like that is his true self to an extent. Mm. Uh, you know, because he's going away, killing all these people and building houses and walls and all this out of bodies. But, but he can sort of retain a degree of non-decay. That was that was the concept behind the first one. Um, and in the in the second one, he's a little bit more weathered. And that was a, the one on the right. Fear sick was almost was a bit more inspired by Dark Tower imagery. You know, the Stephen yeah. King novel. Um, not for any reason other than the fact that this sort of desert landscape that he exists in is is kind of in the same universe as leprosy <laughs> which yeah the death the death album the pink tones yeah the death album but i just it was my idea like a, a lot of these concepts are fully jeremy's and and taylor's they'll often have a dream or just or hit me up with a, a kind of rough sketch and go dan what about this but i put that tower in the background just because i happen to have listen to the i'm not particularly well read or anything but i occasionally listen to the odd audio book so i listened to the dark tower i remembered the michael whelan art for the dark tower and i was like it'd be kind of cool to have something in the background and it doesn't it just asks questions about where does he come from what's he doing it, it, is maybe the first album cover exist in that building and he's dragging them to a new one or maybe the new album the first album exists down that doorway and I, I, I don't know. There's no real answers to that. It is open to interpretation, but I wanted to leave it open to the viewer to go, oh, maybe he's doing this, maybe he's doing that. And just sort of tell it, you know, because stories are always more scary or interesting if you don't know the answers and I, you actually, can fill I in the blanks. After this interview, I think I found the answer. Cool. <laughs> Hit me. Let me give it to you. All right. That could be canon. Yeah. Uh, no, no, this is this is just shit. I'm making a joke. Oh, <laughs> all right. So you used to be an architect. Yeah. You built buildings out of your dead coworkers and you put it on a cover. <laughs> uh, around. But I, yeah, dude, it does have that similarity between the two album covers, though. Yeah. Well, it was just like building stuff. I mean, the idea of just build it, he builds stuff out of bodies was yeah, pretty, um, morbid. pretty cool. And it all came from the song The Neck Step which was the inspiration for the first album cover. Mm, and that yeah. just led down there. And even in the new EP, which isn't up there, but uh, Panic Prayer, there's, if you look subtly in the background, there's still loads of bodies 
all kicking about. So he's in a different situation. It almost feels like he's in a different realm. It's more like a normal um, suburban street, but he's still got bodies in his walls. <laughs> so, and I'm sure this theme will continue <laughs> for, for however long in human condition write music. I, I love these covers, man. It definitely has that late 80s feel to them and you're like you're totally going in on it i also love the fact that you embrace a lot of like purples and pinks but you make them like badass and uh i always really admire art that has that um dark imagery but then you play with colors that are more vibrant and colorful so <laughs> totally love that um these, these definitely like really shelf, caught right? my attention man i mean the, the, i've always had a dominant color scheme that's normally quite garish in any cover so if you look at that they're quite obviously there's the blue one and there's the red one okay there's a bit of greens and stuff going but it it means that um iconic's not the right word and i'd certainly never describe my work as that but most for me iconic covers have a really dominant color scheme rather than yeah. just loads of stuff and it helps you latch into the vibe of the album and create a series of work so i think will progress that as it goes but just as a little side fact the first the rat god color scheme was somewhat inspired by chaos ad the sepultura yeah. album which you probably never think of it until you know that but just those dirty yellowy greens and then that pinky blue that's Waylon as well right yeah i love yeah. his work he's 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 done my favorite album covers of all time but yeah. he's probably my least influenced just because he's too good <laughs> like he's, he's just he's a master he's, he's amazing like like i you know there's certain people that i can't i would call inspiring and but i can't necessarily you probably wouldn't link my work to his and michael way so i try to put easter eggs in different ways of michael wheel and stuff because like the the stylistic choices aren't necessarily similar but um you know, so if I can do something like oh, just a little bit of a color hint towards an album, then great. Um, or an eye, like on a rise, you know. So or or, the, or like faces, like the cause of death, obituary album in the tree. Just I did that in Zentrix, and the the first album I did for Zentrix, Bury the Pain. There's like really subtle nods to the. And we'll, cause we'll talk of, about that one. I think right, yeah, that's cool. the, the gun. Yeah, that's right. That's, yeah, probably a good time to. <laughs> pass on unless you've got any more inhuman condition questions oh, no. I, I didn't mean to cut you off either <laughs> no, it's, it's okay. uh, it is interesting too because like i don't see a lot of um frazetta like influence in your work whereas a lot of i mean like a lot of artists claim him as an influence like for me i claim as an influence but yeah i could totally see waylon repka uh for sure i just think that's kind of unique um like it's all i just always find it very interesting when people talk about their inspiration and influence and um i could see it and then you know obviously you have your own style that you've developed from there i mean i love frank Fazetta's stuff and then obviously sort of following in his footsteps there was ken kelly like boris yeah. vallejo and uh, julie bell those guys that to me were like proteges of Frazetta. yeah i absolutely love their fantasy style of art but I'll be honest, it's pure and simply a case of I don't think I, no, I don't think, I don't, I know I don't have their skills in my personal locker. So I've never really tried to do something that was inspired by it, even though I absolutely love seeing it visually. I think I've done a few pieces. There was a, a bit I did for Glory Hammer that was parodying a couple of the poses from, uh, a Frazetta piece, except with like a gladiator and, uh, and um, a, a Sharon Stone and Total Recall <laughs> put into the positions <laughs> of this. Like, it was really very silly. But I've done Easter eggs in that way more than stylistic things. And I, th and I suppose it's because as a kid, I grew up on the wheel and I grew up on heavy metal album covers. And I know Frazetta has, has done them, but it, uh, probably for Molly Hatchet and stuff. Is that right? Did he do that? Yeah, like, Molly Hatchet. Hatchet. He did so, two album covers. Well, they yeah. were licensed. You know, it was Death exactly. Dealer and then another thing. Like they weren't. It, and then Boris did do a uh, Molly Hatchet album cover as well, and his his is very good. But but like you say, they are licensed, and I never grew up with that as music that I listened to myself. So it was never on my radar to go and do. And because I didn't buy art books and I didn't go to art school, at no point did there was any 
like, you know, I've got some Man of War albums, or a Man of War album that yeah. might be, it might be Ken Kelly. I'm not sure. I can't That's Ken Kelly, yeah. It. Yeah. And it's like, and like, and I've seen the likes of Rainbow Rising, and I love those covers, but none of those were ones that I grew up with as a kid. They're ones that I got into in my, when you're past that point of knowing what you want to do. Um, but I, yeah, there's no better person to learn from than Frazetta really, isn't it? From anatomy to a composition, it just blows my mind. And I don't think my composition is particularly good. It's sometimes fun. And I think the flaws in my ability allow me to do stuff that maybe somebody properly trained wouldn't do. So it's a bit different, but like, so it blows my mind when I see those proper legends somehow composed yeah it's the composition is just incredible never mind the talent to produce the work itself i think that's where Waylon stands above a lot of other fantasy artists is his sense of composition like like obviously technically he's on another level too but like he can capture an iconic image but there's no cheap gimmicks you yeah. know what i mean like, that's right michael Waylon just Every RPG stat is like at like a ten, basically. Yeah, hundred percent. He's completed art as far as I'm concerned, because yeah. his stuff also does the thing which I was going back earlier. It in places it looks photorealistic, but you know it's not a photo because it's otherworldly in yeah, some it's imagination. It's exactly, but he can if he wants to, he can really capture something that it doesn't look like a photo, but it's it feels as realistic as a photo, and that, but in a in, in, a, in a thing that doesn't exist and that's incredible and and i like the fact that he goes he's got done stuff that is dark as well and like like the arise cover and the, the one he did infected nations for evil he he's not just fantasy art in a um you know naked or half naked woman and a barbarian standing on yeah next to a tiger in a jungle cliche sort of thing he he does yeah crazy not hr guy gigas type of darkness but similar realms of alien worlds that mm -hmm. that probably for you as a metal fan I, I can't speak for you but certainly for me that's the stuff that sucks me in more than traditional fantasy art where i guess i understand that it's tarzan yeah yeah, yeah. sci-fi and surrealism that blend is more of my interest as well there's just so much overlap yeah. you know what i mean Definitely. so i'm with you yeah for sure all right we got so you've done multiple covers for Glory Hammer, and you've done a lot of work for Ailstorm. I mean, like a yeah. lot, right? Um, yeah. I just picked these two just for simplicity. Uh, once again, we're seeing the you know the blues, the purples, the pinks, right? I know what you like. Yeah. It's cool. I, but I man, that Glory Hammer cover is unreal. I but well, um, I have I have Chris from Glory Hammer and Ailstorm because um, there's a big overlap in the bands, and I got the Ailstorm gig off the back of doing work for glory hammer first because ah. there's shared the shared members the, the 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 mastermind behind both of those bands is the same guy um but that he added it was his suggestion to add the bikes in which are related to a song in that glory hammer one on the left and i'm so glad he did because at that point it just looked it looked quite cool, but it was a fun landscape yeah. full of anachronisms because it's it's a nuclear bomb going off in a wasteland uh, Scotland sort of thing. But then as soon as you add these uh, fictional characters on laser cycles, it turns <laughs> it into just something completely ridiculous. Um, yeah. and, and just before I forget, those, if anyone was wondering, those, those laser bikes were kind of influenced by a mixture of... Um, the speeder bikes from Return of the Jedi, Tron, and a, an N64 game called Extreme G, which I don't know if you probably be too no, young for that. that. Yeah, which, uh, and it was pretty obscure. Um, but it was just kind of chucking influences in a blender and coming up with something is totally ridiculous, but fun. Like, and I, I love how silly it is, but the music is deadly serious in terms of how well they're trying to execute it. And I love that we can then play with really dumb uh, sort of topics such as yeah yeah you know, fantasy baddies on motorbikes with nuclear bombs going off in the background you guys really are like a perfect combo because you're not afraid to like get fun and light with your work which is so refreshing and like oh i'm a serious metalhead you know like and it, nothing against people that like are doing really like very dark stuff but I like a little bit of like keeping it light and keeping it funny and clever. So I really admire that about your style and approach, man. But 
Thanks. And I think, thank you. Thank you. And I'm glad it appeals to the likes of yourselves because I think a little bit of levity is good. And there's a time to be serious. And if you're writing serious, sad music about issue like political issues or people have died, then sure, you don't want to put jokes and Easter eggs all over that. But, but fundamentally, metal is a bit ridiculous. And I remember yeah. Devin saying on the live strapping young lads album where he sort of says that, you know, he cut off his purple, his mum's purple fuzzy mittens to make a fingerless gloves and the, the <laughs> idea that a bunch of dudes dressed in leather playing guitars or dressed up like vikings or wearing corpse paint and singing songs about satan and it's it in the nicest way possible and i love it all it's a bit it's a bit ridiculous and i don't mean ridiculous bad i mean just it's as a, a concept it's quite fun like cannibal corpse lyrics like if i love the bleeding i've been i've had that for, as i mentioned for so long and i've been listening again into the day in the car if you take that seriously without thinking for a second that it's just ridiculous fantasy horror fun i think you're getting them wrong for me you're getting the wrong message of it or a little bit yeah so that's not to say that cannibal corpse should have flowers or jokes on their cover it's more that for me i just extract the fun from music and getting the enjoyment factor yeah because that's because that's why we go to gigs and you know we go to gigs not to be sad or miserable most of the time or you want to have a good time so yeah that's awesome man from a so, technical perspective um i wanted to talk about a couple of these pieces and I'm, I'm not trying to get all pretentious with it so no, sure you have an excellent um, eye for depth within a piece and atmospheric perspective. So basically, for the viewers, as things get further away, they get more faint and they get more bluish tones. So in the Glory Hammer, you can see a very distant, like kind of castle slash mountain. And with the Ale Storm, what brings that front figure forward is all that, um, you know, there's no hard lines on those like stalactites or mites, whatever they're called, behind. So I just want to bring that to the attention of the viewers like that. Those decisions is what makes somebody like a professional level versus kind of an amateur, in my opinion, because it brings everything in the right perspective. The eye is brought to the right place. Um, I always like to just kind of talk about some of the things from a technical perspective that make a piece work. Thanks. Yeah. And I think a lot of that comes from trial and error. And because a lot of the time I don't know what colors a piece is going to be. I, don't know how it's going to look and i like happy accidents along the way but at the end of the day you've got a goal which to me let's take that hailstorm one is you're going to have a background in a cave and you're going to have a guy at the front who you want to be the focal point of it you want the eye to go straight to the, the guy at the front and see what he's doing and then after that you go let's have a look in the background and that's full of donkey kong easter eggs in the background because mm -hmm. for whatever reason um <laughs> uh, and uh, there's, a, there's a song that was a cover of a donkey kong song and the crystal coconut was taken from donkey kong's hence the sort of nintendo references here yeah but you don't a lot of my early work suffered from concentrating on the details in the background and the less important things first and i think over time i realized that you need to have a main focal point uh, that you're instantly drawn to so even as a thumbnail it works but then when you get it on vinyl it's even better yeah um, because if you just have everything as eye-catching nothing becomes eye-catching and it just turns into a mess of details especially when it's scaled down so okay and, and beyond that is just trying to create an atmosphere so with the stalag whites and tights like you mentioned it's all a bit hazy because that's just meant to be a bit of a foggy cave in the distance that's a bit mystical and yeah. and and i don't want many colors in that because I, like i say i'd like to have a dominant color and in that case to me that's a purple album i know there's reds and blues and grays in it but to me um curse of the crystal coconut is it's a purple album and the glory hammer one is pink even though it's probably more blue than that um and just having that dominant color behind means that you've got something for the thing at the front to pop as well by having a contrasting color and then maybe i guess just try to create a strong silhouette um if you were to turn it into black and white or to like really just turn it into two main simple colors um so those are always the goals, but you just you just want something that is immediately recognizable as a fun album cover, but then has other stuff in it if you want to spend more than 30 seconds looking at it. That to me is always the goal. Yeah. Do you oftentimes 
uh, you know, like take a screenshot when you're in the process and then look at it on your phone and look at it really small? Do you do anything like that? <laughs> yeah, normally to look towards the end of a project um, so I don't get too depressed by doing it in the start. But towards the end, I always, once I've finished a bit, you're looking at it on the phone to see if it works and hope that it's yeah. translated. Because it's super important because um, f in, f I don't, funnily enough, I don't like work when it comes out on cds as much because you're designing it for vinyl off to be viewed as a big thing on a screen and when it comes out on a cd it's always like ah oh, the details have always been compressed so you're almost doing it for thumbnails and vinyl it's almost ex the extremities of is how i think of if something yeah. will work and then just hope that it's okay on a cd and especially as printing companies always print it a bit darker and murkier in reality then and that always loses some of the details and the contrast so i've definitely focused more on the small than the large um because you want to to me you want to be if you're going through spotify and you're seeing something that's like a centimeter by a centimeter max you want it to instantly be like that's an album cover for this but then when people spend their however much a vinyl costs these days in dollars or pounds or whatever currency you want them to feel like they've got their money's worth for art there so i think those are just battles that you face as a an album cover artist that i never used to consider but do now that's a really good point uh Balsama talks a little bit about that as well like the printing a little darker so that's one of the learning lessons he learned um specifically for like the uh soulfly cover that he did so definitely a yeah. company there and, and my I, very quickly my co my covers always struggle because i use such garish bright colors often they work in rgb but as soon as you try to put them into cmyk the the printer gamut doesn't have it in their <laughs> in their spectrum and it's always like oh that that bright cyan -y green color is going to come out dull but hey most people look at stuff on their computers these days anyway so if it looks fun and bright on there that's that's the main thing cool centrix yeah so do you remind me roughly of the years on these? So the one on the left is the new album. Did that come out in 23 or 22? 22, I think. That was last year. Okay. So and, and then this other one, is it like 2014? Or when did this thing come out? I can look it up real quick. I It was originally meant to come out in, I think, I 2014. Totally off. It came out four years later than it actually was completed, both musically and art-wise, because they changed singers. So I, I think it probably came out 2018, maybe, but it was meant to be 2014. I keep searching on my phone and it keeps auto-correcting to C, so I need to figure that out. But there, I mean, so as a you know new UK native, like how big was Zentrix in that scene? Because up until recently, like we don't talk about Zentrix much in the United States, so I was just kind of curious what that looked like. And yeah, the seven words came out in 2022 and then um let me see the other one here bury the pain bury the pain that is oh 2019 wow 2019. Totally but but it was meant to be completed 2014 2015 okay but, got it that's when you painted it that's when i did it yeah um the i the zentrix were a bit before my time uh, when growing up and also going back to what I was saying about the UK being a year behind maybe even two years behind on thrash I think Canada were like a year behind the Americans and 1990 91 just killed thrash right so yeah uh, the big bands they, they changed adapted or like Slayer would just do what Slayer did but not quite as good once it got into the 90s and Metallica went down a different path and grunge just ruined all the small bands and i think what happened is zentrix could have been really good but that was a time before cross the seas pollination like we get these days and yeah. i think grunge had just ruined thrash so they they tried to do their own black album by about 93 like slowing down writing more catchy songs but it probably wasn't what everybody loved at, about the first two zentrix records which are phenomenal um to whose advantage yeah yeah for whose advantage is killer and i love the cover for that shattered existence is is good musically the cover's a bit um yeah a bit rough around the edges but but for whose advantage is great but i wasn't there at the time but zentrix are one of the big three or four um 
UK thrash bands alongside Sabbath, Onslaught and Acid Rain, who across the pond guys probably don't care about or wouldn't have heard of. But, you know, okay, they weren't as good as Metallica and Megadeth and Slayer, but they were really good in their own right. But basically the band passed me by up until they did an album in like the mid 90s, late 90s called Scourge, which again wasn't particularly widely well received and doesn't sound like what they sound like now and they just sort of died until they reformed with their latest two records which are killer and they, they've moved from a i guess a metallica with a bit of among the living anthrax sound into fully well, testament to testament and exodus it's yeah. right it's just basically a mixture of testament and exodus modern te- like tuned down to d um but you know they're produced by andy sneep as well like who does the testament and exodus stuff so that that crunch is there and those two records i i, I love them they're amazing i've actually played on live i've played a, a gig what well, just one song with uh Zentrix on two occasions uh, oh, got sick, up and jammed man. a song with them which was super good fun um but uh, th- that was i mentioned andy sneep i got the the gig for these guys through andy who i've done a lot of i've known for a long time back from the audio engineering days and doing work for his band. And then when Zentrix reformed and they know, they know each other really well, he put them in touch with me and we've been, I've been friends with the Zentrix guys ever since. So, and uh, you know, they're just one of those bands that you mentioned earlier. If you do a decent job and you work hard and you get the band, you understand the band. I mean, they'll ask you back and I really hope that they'll, keep doing more records because they're both great but seven seven words especially i was like you know the the comeback album was good will this one be as good but it it tops it as far as i'm concerned i gotta check it out man i really like to whose advantage i like that kind of testament thrash sound i think yeah and i think just like one of the more timeless thrash bands you know for sure i love testament myself but this is more like um you know formation of damnation testament style yeah. onwards as opposed to you know practice what you preach or um ritual kind of between that era that they were maybe before which is cool i like modern testament as well so yeah i gotta yeah. check this out we want to go on a run or hit the gym or something yeah it's yeah it's good for that it's good solid stuff like i really yeah can't speak highly enough of it how do you feel like the result of the uh, the album art? Like, what do you like about each one or any kind of comments on them? Uh, yeah, I like the fact that um, In Human Condition saw my Bury the Pain artwork and got, <laughs> they wanted to work <laughs> and off the back of that. <laughs> nice. Because uh, that's led to so many good things. Um, yeah, I, I like them both. I, I like, there's a little, there's a few things I think anatomy wise I'd ideally have done better on seven words. But to me, that, I like that cover every time I see it um, because it, 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 I think it does exactly what I'd set out to do. And that is feel like a, a thrash cover from the eighties, nineties. There was a bit of an influence from an amazing cover by Repka. Um, uh, oh, uh, oh, uh, not uh, evil dead. Uh, Annihilation of civilization, uh, which is a really gr- hazy green sky with a blue streak. through it. that was a little nod to that. Because to me, that cover just perfectly captures what I want to do with with this one. And that is just evoke a vibe of almost like warfare and just shit has gone totally wrong. And this one's more anarchy as opposed to uh, post-nuclear uh, sitting on a beach. But this, yeah. the same attitude is there. And um, But the you know, other little bits of information which are maybe more interesting than me speaking about the art is that the trench coat there was inspired by terminator which was uh, a recommendation for the band but Terminator is one of my top five favorite films of all time so i was like yes oh, i'll yeah. happily do, happily do that and then as far as easter eggs go there's on the background for all the buildings there's graffiti of the song titles that oh, exist cool. and so things like that that not many you, you wouldn't know unless you really delve super deep into it um, and then bury the pain one. I mean, I know that came out fairly recently, but that was one of my, in the grand scheme of things, earlier covers. Because mm-hmm. I've been doing this, I've been doing this since 2010 properly, and that was probably 2014 when I was working on it. And in the early days, I wasn't working for that many sort of established bands. So, um, but it, it's again, it's fun and it does the job. And like with all of them, I notice so many flaws 
in them that I don't like to look at them too heavily. But if other people like them... Well, that's what I'm here for. I'm here to rub your face in them. Yeah, <laughs> go for it, man. <laughs> Let me... Hey, dude, you can't improve without criticism. So anything that's wrong, I always like to hear it because it's the sort of thing where you go, oh, well, focus on that a bit better next time. Um, yeah, I'm not. Like, I'm not gonna give you any criticism on any of your like really old work, but hey, man, if you ever want to like email me something that's like in the progress and like, hey, any advice or what you would do differently, I'm happy to give you my two yes. cents. Now, is it always well founded? I don't know, but that's kind of one of the benefits of a network artist is like you can get a second pair of eyes if you want it. So it's it's super handy. I appreciate that, and I probably yeah, I'm more than happy. I never like to force my stuff upon people unless they sort of ask for it, and even though I do sometimes. But that would be appreciated because no, I'd be honored, always, man. Yeah, it always it always really helps, and you get a different opinion on it. And I mean, I'm really bad for certain things. Like any artist will tell you, oh, make sure you check it in monochrome. Make sure you flip it so it looks good back to front. And I'm like, yeah, I should do that every time. And then every new project comes in. And it's like, nope, I'm going to do it the same. That I always did it. And it means that probably when you look at it in a mirror, it's a bit <laughs> it's a bit wonky here or there. But I mean, it's I always know. the face that gets you, man. I mean, yeah. like, and I, I, I run of those things all the time too you know so you just live and learn but i like the um like the kind of concept art design of the skeleton creatures like yeah. it reminds me a little bit of seagrave a little bit like the um you know that uh warbringer cover that has like those creatures and they're like this it's one of like the mid 2010s warbringer covers they're they're that kind of tone of like the sepia yellow kind of thing but I like how he did that, and you also did that. Your creatures look completely different. I'm just saying, like, instead of just making a skeleton, you made, like, a demonic skeleton concept art kind of character design. And I like that you went that extra effort there. Yeah, it's kind of the demons, really, like, because the principle is, yeah. okay, you're seeing them physically, but they're inside the guy's head, you know, and they're, they're tormenting him, whether they're, whether they're real or not. You know, that's the, the premise is that these, you know, he's made him he's done something silly that he shouldn't have done hence the blood and the gun and those are his demons tormenting him for his crimes or what have you so but yeah like demons and monsters and ribs and skulls are always great fun really oh, i think yeah. for any artist who loves metal they're, they're the best things to draw you can never get enough of them <laughs> you really can't all right this is the last slide so i want to go back to some of your really really early covers just because i want to do a whole chronological thing right so we got some sure. of your you know, contemporary stuff, but if I'm not mistaken, that Silosis cover on the right is one of your earliest um, album covers. And then this thing on the left, I wanted to bring that up just because it has a little more of that pen and ink style. Still yeah. done digitally, though, right? That's right, yeah. Um, but I want to kind of showcase that because you do a lot of um, T-shirt designs and you make them a little less painterly. You're thinking more about graphic design and stuff, and I think that's really cool too. And, and screen printing as well, and and, yeah. and and how details work on a T-shirt. Because, I mean, a lot of bands want me to do T-shirts where it's like the album cover done on it, but I'm always sort of saying, oh, I'm trying to say, those details won't, like nobody's coming up to you and going, hey man, I really like that tiny detail there on your T-shirt. You want it to look good from three feet, 10 feet away. But yeah, um, but yeah this... I know I've known Josh uh, Middleton from Silosis since the probably late 2000s when Silosis weren't really very big at all. My band was also and remains to, <laughs> has never been big at all. And we'd be on the Andy Sneap audio engineering forum and we'd get chatting and we'd share demos and, and stuff via email. And then Silosis obviously got bigger and better. And when it came to the, Se this is their second proper album um they'd had another piece done by um i hope i can say it was dan mumford i don't know if you're familiar with dan mumford yeah i know yeah work. i mean he's a he's huge these days he, but he, he's moved on from record covers to mostly done doing like um well he'll do maiden and metallica stuff but there's um, a lot of like, like movie posters, related stuff posters, too. right and, and he'd done a cover for that that was like was good but was a bit you know his style it's a yeah. bit soft it's a bit clean and soft in tone for a thrash band and um silosis like josh was mad into the work of pushead and john dyer Baisley from baroness so mm -hmm. he, he, 
I mean, I guess I hadn't really done that much at that stage, but I'd already done a T-shirt design actually in pen and ink, like not digitally. I The first one of the, I did a shredding from Reading T-shirt, like again, maybe 2008. That was the first thing I did for Silosis. And because that was more of that puss head style um, stippling and line art, he wanted something like that for this cover. So he just got in touch with me. It actually started off with, uh, oh, hey, dude, could, I did, uh, a paint like him he's saying this hey dude i did this painting i want something like this can you edit it to make it a little bit bit more professional so then i digitally paint over something that he's done in oil or or, or acrylics or something and that wasn't really working and he was like can we just start from scratch and just you go and do a sort of puss head john dyer Baisley thing and it doesn't really look like either of those but it's um it's that line art style, right? That it's not something that I really do on album covers at all yeah. these days. Although I did do it for their second, their, their third album, Monolith, which was also me. And I think it's just because J Josh, like, although he's, his favorite bands are the same as mine, the Pantera, Metallica, um, Death type, Sepultura sort of bands. But he, I don't think visually he liked to represent himself with that sort of 80s, 90s thrash art. And he's much more aesthetically into line art or then even the kind of grimy photoshoppy stuff of human or fear factory which that you know photo montage stuff things that carcass would do as well you know carcass like i love carcass i'd love to work with carcass but my art's not really necessarily appropriate for that they have a lot more of that human anatomy pen and ink style stuff yeah so they work with the artists who did uh the ghost album covers i i'm blanking on his yeah. name but he's immensely talented yeah really good um super detailed and really and it's and and yeah you know, i think bands want need to employ guys that will be fitting for the style of their band and although again silosis totally. they're yeah they have thrash but they're not a, a throwback thrash band if you know what i mean they're not they're not a band that they that sound like oh we just wanted to try and play like this retro sort of uh drinking beer like 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 municipal waste and I'm, I'm not saying that in a bad way against municipal waste they're awesome but they're very right. different it's the identity yeah 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 so so that's where we yeah and you know what this is one of my first covers and it's a lot of people's favorite cover that i've done and this is the thing that makes me feel better if anybody wouldn't like my art because it's like some people like one of my earliest roughest um sort of pieces yeah. so it's it's funny how this is it this isn't my favorite by any long shot yeah but you you probably grew up with more similar maybe the sort of covers that i liked or the same artists that i like and it's not that i dislike that sort of art it's just that that yeah. is what i would out if i had free will that's not the sort of stuff that i would gravitate towards myself i can yeah i'll happily i'll happily do it if people love it but it's not what i would i would choose to do myself but for silosis it's more appropriate than you know a repka style zombie <laughs> eating an arm or something yeah i agree with you no totally sweet man yeah let me move this hey back again yeah well wow almost two and a half hours in man i <laughs> i once again i just want to say i'm really grateful for your time and i it kind of flew by you know and uh your energy is infectious Especially at that, you know, late hour in uh, Scotland, man. But um, any uh, last words you want to say for the audience? You, you gave out some advice earlier, but feel free to, you know, add any kind of final things before we wrap up. Yeah, I, I honestly, I don't think I've, I'm better at answering questions than um, offering anything off the back. But just, yeah, thank you ever so much for firstly having me this uh, on your on your podcast and also um, or YouTube and anybody who wants to check out my work i am on instagram and on, on facebook and stuff and i'd be delighted if they like it but also i take zero offense if people don't like it and aren't into it and into other things because that's just that's the beauty of the world that we exist in so um but also i'd be interested to see a bunch of your stuff and i'm sure maybe after this ends i'll have a wee bit of a chat to you about like the kind of things that you do and, and what have you but yeah, i'm always here, a I, pieces for sure i mean i love seeing art in general I'm just, as you can probably tell i like to ramble i like to talk <laughs> about this it's not so much about talking about myself but it's talking about stuff that i love i could just chat forever and uh it's just really nice to do so so hopefully i'll get to do this sort of thing a little bit more often and uh, 
<laughs> I'll try and be a bit shorter in my answers, but uh, I find it hard. No, it's, it's why I can't do Twitter because I, I am on it and I've tried to post a few things, but it's like I can't say everything I want to say in 140 characters. I need I need 1400 characters to explain why I like everything. And this is the same. I can't sum up my experience with all these bands in even five, ten, fifteen minute snap it, snippets. I'd probably like to tell you stories about. You know, everything way wider than what we've spoken about today but yeah you can't really, no one wants to hear me talk for five hours on this probably least of all you so <laughs> nah so, man yeah. nah it, this is so much fun and you're you're a natural storyteller you're very humble you're extremely skilled and um please check out dan goldsworthy he's on facebook instagram his work is all over the place i'm sure his trajectory for his career is just going to keep going up but yeah, support him wherever you can. Buy the albums that he um, has a hand in making in terms of the visual direction. And until next time, I'll see you guys around. But yeah, go ahead and hang on just for a second. See you, everybody. Bye. Cheers.